God sends men and women for purposes and messages, and the prophet Bishop Clarence C. McLennan was sent with the apostolic and prophetic assignment of being called to the nations with a message. The apostolic and prophetic assignment of Bishop McClendon takes place through regular weekly worship experiences and periodic prophetic encounters of consecutive nights of revelatory teaching, as well as global conferences and crusades. Clarency McClendon Ministries and the Place of Grace are stewarding the apostolic and prophetic call placed upon it by the Father. We are covering the globe with the grace of God, the healing grace of Jesus of Nazareth, and taking the message of the finished work of Jesus to the nations. This assignment is the Academy of Healing and Wellness, which teaches the healing grace of Jesus and includes the instruction of the healing of bodies, lands, and nations, and is broadcast live across the globe. The central nucleus and headquarters for the assignment of the prophet is the Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center. Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center, a learning, training, and sending out center, will be a television-ready studio where content can be captured, produced, and sent out worldwide. Ministry programs like the Alpha Care Program and the Kingdom Life Curriculum, designed to help the sons of God and the systems of the world become effective children of the Kingdom. Weekly and holiday ministry food outreaches to the less fortunate in the Los Angeles area, with the Cosmopolitan Center functioning as the headquarters, is an ongoing commitment. Bishop Clarence C. McLennan and the Place of Grace is not a physical location, but a spiritual destination. Become a partner with us today. Our children are under attack by a satanic assault in the areas of sexual identity and immorality right under our noses. Sneaky politics and brazen perversion in education are aggressively indoctrinating our youth to reject godly principles. There's a lot of people who think they're something because the spirit that entered them as children has been expressing itself through them uninterrupted by anyone with spiritual discernment or knowledge or authority. In this searing prophetic encounter, Bishop McClendon exposes these deceptive tactics. Yet it is up to us to police the atmosphere and use our authority in Christ Jesus to destroy them. It's not about your political affiliation. It's about lifting the darkness off of a generation for our sons and daughters will prophesy and glorify the living God. Severity of the times has unleashed God a sends men and women for purposes and, and messages, the hot and the prophet Bishop Clarence McClendon was sent with the apostolic to and prophetic assignment of being must called first to acknowledge that its ideology is based on a historic lie and not biblical truth. Race is not in the mind of God. Race is not distinguished in the Bible. Race is not remotely a Christian concept. So my question is, why does the church 
continue to engage in the divisive narrative of race. In this unapologetic and confrontational series, Bishop McClendon lays an axe to the root of hatred and bigotry, using biblical evidence to prove God divided men first on the basis of their language and ultimately on the basis of their covenant relationship with Him and not their skin color. Order this resource today when you visit our website or call 310-323-2600. The severity of the times has unleashed a plethora of perplexities worldwide, including the hotly debated issue of racial equality. But in order to deconstruct racism, we must first acknowledge that its ideology is based on a historic lie and not biblical truth. Race is not in the mind of God. Race is not distinguished in the Bible. Race is not remotely a Christian concept. So my question is, why does the church continue to engage in the divisive narrative of race. In this unapologetic and confrontational series, Bishop McClendon lays an ax to the root of hatred and bigotry, using biblical evidence to prove God divided men first on the basis of their language and ultimately on the basis of their covenant relationship with Him and not their skin color. Order this resource today when you visit our website or call 310-323-2600. The severity of the times has unleashed a plethora of perplexities worldwide, including the hotly debated issue of racial equality. But in order to deconstruct racism, we must first acknowledge that its ideology is based on a historic lie and not biblical truth. Race is not in the mind of God. Race is not distinguished in the Bible. Race is not remotely a Christian concept. So my question is, why does the church continue to engage in the divisive narrative of race. In this unapologetic and confrontational series, Bishop McClendon lays an ax to the root of hatred and bigotry, using biblical evidence to prove God divided men first on the basis of their language and ultimately on the basis of their covenant relationship with Him and not their skin color. Order this resource today when you visit our website or call 310-323-2600. The severity of the times has unleashed a plethora of God. Is God sends men and women for purposes and, for and messages. These and the prophet Bishop Clarence McClendon. He's not shaking the economy so it can shake. He's shaking it to replace it with a new kingdom economy of sowing and reaping. Uh, of being a blessing and receiving a harvest. God is releasing extreme, unshakable favor on every kingdom promise as long as we keep standing on His unshakable word. Don't miss this powerful teaching from Bishop McClendon about God's plans for His covenant people. Your time to live a prosperous life in these unstable times starts now. It's about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ taking its rightful place in the earth, possessing what it's supposed to possess, taking territory, land, property, money, business. The Shaking, available now at the digital download store. Prepare to receive today's word with a recap from the prophet's recent messages. A number of things that are going on right now in the world. It says, in these porches lay a great multitude of impotent people, so they're lacking power. That's what impotent means. Blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down 
at a certain time into the pool and stirred the water. Then whoever, everybody say whoever, yeah. stepped in first. Everybody say first. first. Look at your neighbor and say first, 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 first. <laughs> then whoever stepped in first was made well of whatever disease he had. Now that's where we get the slogan for the place of grace, this ministry, a place where whoever can be healed of whatever. The Bible says an angel went down at a certain time in the pool and stirred the water and whoever stepped in first was made well of whatever disease he had. And that's where the Spirit of God arrested me in 1999. That's where the vision for this house, this assignment, and this ministry began to come clear. He said, son, pay attention. He said, verse number four is the problem verse of the chapter. I said, God, help me understand. He said, verse number four is a true statement. I am telling you what was actually happening at the place. He said, but verse number four also reveals my original purpose for the place is not being fulfilled. He said, you are looking at my church. My intention for the place is for it to be a place of undeserved favor and enabling power when people get into the pool of grace. He said, but people are getting stuck. And what is happening is now there is a legend that is going out from the place that is not indicative of my purpose for the place. I said, God, help me. He said, notice it says, whoever stepped in first. I said, yes. He said, does that sound like undeserved favor? I said, no, sir. I said, no, it doesn't. Because in this place, you have to be first to get well. And if, oh, you're not listening. And if it's a place of undeserved favor, then you wouldn't have to earn your wellness. You could receive it whether you were first or second or third or fourth. Are you still here? I said, yes, sir. He, he says, this is a picture of my original intent, but it also reveals why power is lacking and impotence prevails in much of the church because it has become a place of merit and human effort and not a place of undeserved favor. So what is happening in verse 4 is truly stated, but it's not a statement of truth. This is people's experience at the place but not God's purpose for the place. Let me look at you very clearly and tell you that it may just be that your experience at one of God's churches has not been what he actually intended. So I don't necessarily judge you for not wanting to go, but I am telling you, God is changing the dynamic of his place. And one of the things the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, this year, tell my people I'm reclaiming my places. Are you in the building? Notice, the Bible said, Jesus says, rise up, rise, take up your bed and walk. Verse number nine, it says, and immediately the man was made whole. So his carrying the bed was not a part of his healing. He was, y'all aren't here. He was healed before he took up the bed. So I said, Lord, then why do you tell him to carry the bed? And the Lord said to me, he said, because if you are going to walk in my grace, you are going to have to be able to confront people who come at you with the law and disregard them and ignore them and not let them ruin your grace walk. Grab your neighbor's hand and tell them I'm in a grace walk. You understand? Say it again. I'm in a grace walk. I'm not doing this because I met all the conditions. I'm not here because I passed all the tests. I'm not here because I met all the rules. I am here because I got a revelation of a God who gives me better than I deserve. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Lay your hand on your name and say grace, grace, grace. 
There's got to be a place where people are told that it's not your merit, not your goodness, not your perfection that merits God's goodness. It is what Jesus has said and done. Notice. He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. Took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. So Jesus told him immediately break the rules. I, I love it. I, I love it. I love it. He heals him and says, break the I love this because Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. And then Jesus disappears. You don't see him until a few minutes later. We'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. So this man now is walking with his bed on the Sabbath, and Jesus knows the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religionists are going to get him. Look at your neighbor and ask him, have you ever felt set up by Jehovah? Have, have you ever felt that he put you in a place of conflict? Here's what I'm telling you. It's so you can walk the grace walk. Let me also say this. Let me also say this. Every walk in grace is going to be done with some sort of legal imperfection. No, you know, you didn't get what I just said. Every walk in grace is going to occur with some kind of legal imperfection. Somebody is going to be able to point out why you shouldn't be where you are, why you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Don't get mad about that anymore. Take your scar and wear it proudly because I almost died, but grace lifted me. I almost sunk, but grace got me out. I didn't deserve to be here, but the grace of God. Touch three people say, wear it proudly. Yes, sir. Let them see it. Don't be ashamed when your imperfection shows up because when you know you're walking in grace, you know whatever they say about you can't stop it. Whatever they do to you cannot stop your grace walk. Watch this, sit down. <laughs> Look at you and say, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not flawless. I know I still got a few issues. But what you don't understand is I'm not walking like this because I've been flawless. I'm walking like this because God has been good. I'm not here because I did everything right. I'm here because Jesus did everything right. And I'm trusting in his finished work. A place of grace. See, the house of God is not the place where people find Jesus. It's the place where Jesus finds you. See, the house of God is not the place where you're supposed to go to find the word. The house of God is the place where you're supposed to come to let the word find you and correct you and adjust you. See, God loves you the way you are, but too much to leave you that way. So he brings you to a corporate gathering of saints so his word can keep finding you and check this and cut that and nip this and correct that and adjust that. I don't need to come to church to hear from God. I have the Holy Spirit in me. This is not the place I come to hear from God. I got a Bible and the Spirit of God. This is the place I come to let the Word find me to confirm what God has already said to me. To correct my walk, oh God. I wish I had time to preach this. And this is the move of the spirit that is now upon us. Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see. You've been able see the house of God is the place you come to see how well you are. No, 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 you didn't get it. No, you didn't get it. 
I, I, I didn't say to, to, to qualify. No, to see how well you have been made. The house of God is the place you come and hear you are the righteousness of God. You are holy. You are healed. You are prospered. You are delivered. This is the place where you see exactly how well his finished work has made you. And you believe that. And then you go away walking in that. Not focused on your sickness, but focused on how well he has made you. And if you focus on how well he has made you, that wellness will begin to manifest in your life. And you'll be walking free of things you couldn't get delivered of for 38 years. There are three essential things that happen, three, three essential occurrences that take place at this place of grace that God is purposed to happen here and every place of grace that he is reclaiming, whether that's the name or not. The first thing that happens here is the removal of legend and tradition that has been masquerading as truth. It is, it, is, it is the removal of legend and tradition that has been masquerading as truth. It's been masquerading as truth. See, all the people there thought that only the first person in could get well. And Jesus comes and shows up and says, you don't actually need the pool. You don't need any of the people to help you get in it. I can handle this all by myself. Me and my word can do this. So he, he removes, and, and watch it, because this is what is happening right now. Legend that has been masquerading as truth is being removed from the house of God. And some people can't handle it because they've been so comfortable in their legend that they can't actually handle Jesus when he shows up. The second essential thing that happens here is the revelation of ministry that understands the human condition yet challenges the human condition it understands it but it challenges it jesus has compassion for the state the man has been in the bible says he looked at him and the bible says when he knew he had been struggling for 38 years when he knew that he'd been ill, when he knew he'd been struggling with addiction 38 years, struggling with perversion 38 years, struggling with homosexuality 38 years, struggling with lesbianism 38 years, when he knew, he said, I understand the condition. I'm not judging or condemning you for how you've lived. But do you want to be made well? Do you want to get better? See, this is the message that places of grace have to adopt. We have to adopt the message that tells me we understand where you are, but you can't stay that way if you're going to walk with us. We're not going to bring the doctrine down to your experience. We're going to say we understand how you've been living, but let us show you a more excellent way. And if you'll walk in the grace, you see, grace is the kingdom force. It is the only kingdom force that is empowered to deal with the condition you've been in a long time. See, you didn't get what I just said. Grace is empowered to deal with the condition you've been in a long time. Not even faith will change the condition you've been in a long time if it is not preceded by a revelation of grace. I'm going to say it again. Not even faith can deal with the condition you've been in a long time until it is preceded by a revelation of grace. Because as long as you don't believe you deserve it, you will never be able to contend for it. As long as you think it will only happen by your merit, 
then you will be knocked off of your faith confession. Jesus' faith gave you access to grace, not yours. Because if he hadn't done what he did, you could do all the believing you want. You wouldn't have any grace because the price wasn't paid. Are you still here? Through whom also we have access by faith, Jesus' faith, into this grace in which we stand. I was reading this. And the Lord said to me, he said, son, you see that you stand in grace? I said, yes, sir. He said, and you walk by faith? I said, yes, sir. And then he said this to me, have you ever seen anybody who can walk before they can stand? Come on, stay with me. He said, you see this, son? I said, you stand in grace? Yes. You walk by faith? Yes. He said, have you ever seen anybody who can walk before they can stand? If you cannot stand, you cannot walk. Okay, try. I'll wait. I'll wait. Try. You look at me like, I mean, you don't even need a revelation for that. Try. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, this is why, although my people have been taught faith, much of it is not working for them. Because they are not standing in grace. They don't actually believe that what they confess they have a right to receive. They don't actually believe that what my word says they deserve because they're still trusting in their own ability to get it and not my finished work. And so if they're war walking by faith for six weeks and then they blow it and have a big mistake, they feel like they go all the way back to square one and have to start over. And God wants you to say, no, 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 no. You didn't get here because of your confession. You got here because of my grace if you fall get up say it again you don't go back to square one we are moving on here now see when you understand that it won't take you six months to get anything it says in these porches lay a great multitude of of impotent people so they're lacking power that's what impotent means blind lame paralyzed waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred the water then whoever everybody say whoever yeah. stepped in first everybody say first yeah. look at your neighbor say first 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 <laughs> then whoever stepped in first was made well of whatever disease he had, and that's where we get the slogan for the place of grace, this ministry, a place where whoever can be healed of whatever. The Bible says an angel went down at a certain time in the pool and stirred the water, and whoever stepped in first was made well of whatever disease he had. And that's where the Spirit of God arrested me in 1999. That's where the vision for this house, this assignment, and this ministry began to come clear. He said, son, pay attention. He said, verse number four is the problem verse of the chapter. I said, God, help me understand. He said, verse number four is a true statement. I am telling you what was actually happening at the place. He said, but verse number four also reveals my original purpose for the place is not being fulfilled. He said, you are looking at my church. My intention for the place is for it to be a place of undeserved favor and enabling power when people get into the pool of grace. He said, but people are getting stuck. And what is happening is now there is a legend that is going out from the place that is not indicative of my purpose for the place. I said, God, help me. He said, notice it says, whoever stepped in first. I said, yes. He said, does that sound like undeserved favor? I said, no, sir. I said, no, it doesn't. Because in this place, you have to be first to get well. And if, oh, you're not listening. And if it's a place of undeserved favor, then you wouldn't have to earn your wellness. 
You can receive it whether you were first or second or third or fourth. Are you still here? I said, yes, sir. He, he says, this is a picture of my original intent, but it also reveals why power is lacking and impotence prevails in much of the church because it has become a place of merit and human effort and not a place of undeserved favor. So what is happening in verse 4 is truly stated, but it's not a statement of truth. This is people's experience at the place, but not God's purpose for the place. Let me look at you very clearly and tell you that it may just be that your experience at one of God's churches has not been what he actually intended. So I don't necessarily judge you for not wanting to go, but I am telling you, God is changing the dynamic of his place. And one of the things the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, this year, tell my people I'm reclaiming my places. Are you in the building? Notice, the Bible said, Jesus says, rise up, Rise, take up your bed and walk, verse number nine. It says, and immediately the man was made whole. So his carrying the bed was not a part of his healing. He was, y'all aren't here. He was healed before he took up the bed. So I said, Lord, then why do you tell him to carry the bed? And the Lord said to me, he said, because if you are going to walk in my grace, you are going to have to be able to confront people who come at you with the law and disregard them and ignore them and not let them ruin your grace walk. Grab your neighbor's hand and tell them I'm in a grace walk. You understand? Say it again, I'm in a grace walk. I'm not doing this because I met all the conditions. I'm not here because I passed all the tests. I'm not here because I met all the rules. I am here because I got a revelation of a God who gives me better than I deserve. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Lay your hand on your neighbor and say, grace, grace, grace. There's got to be a place where people are told that it's not your merit, not your goodness, not your perfection that merits God's goodness. It is what Jesus has said and done. Notice. He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. So Jesus told him, immediately break the rules. <laughs> I, I love it. I, I love it. I love it. He heals him and says, break the I love this because Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. And then Jesus disappears. You don't see him until a few minutes later. We'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. So this man now is walking with his bed on the Sabbath, and Jesus knows the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religionists are going to get him. Look at your neighbor and ask him, have you ever felt set up by Jehovah? Have you ever felt that he puts you in a place of conflict? Here's what I'm telling you. It's so you can walk the grace walk. Let me also say this. Let me also say this. Every walk in grace is going to be done with some sort of legal imperfection. No, you know, you didn't get what I just said. Every walk in grace is going to occur with some kind of legal imperfection. Somebody is going to be able to point out why you shouldn't be where you are, why you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Don't get mad about that anymore. 
take your scar and wear it proudly because I almost died but grace lifted me I almost sunk but grace got me out I didn't deserve to be here but the grace of God touched three people say wear it proudly let them see it don't be ashamed when your imperfection shows up because when you know you're walking in grace you know whatever they say about you can't stop it whatever they do to you cannot stop your grace walk watch this sit down <laughs> look at you i know i'm not perfect i know i'm not flawless i know i still got a few issues but what you don't understand is I'm not walking like this because I've been flawless. I'm walking like this because God has been good. I'm not here because I did everything right. I'm here because Jesus did everything right. And I'm trusting in his finished work. A place of grace. See, the house of God is not the place where people find Jesus. It's the place where Jesus finds you. See, the house of God is not the place where you're supposed to go to find the word. The house of God is the place where you're supposed to come to let the word find you and correct you and adjust you. See, God loves you the way you are, but too much to leave you that way. So he brings you to a corporate gathering of saints so his word can keep finding you and check this and cut that and nip this and correct that and adjust it. I don't need to come to church to hear from God. I have the Holy Spirit in me. This is not the place I come to hear from God. I got a Bible and the Spirit of God. This is the place I come to let the Word find me to confirm what God has already said to me. To correct my walk, oh God. I wish I had time to preach this. And this is the move of the spirit that is now upon us. Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see. You've been able see the house of God is the place you come to see how well you are. No, 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 you didn't get it. No, you didn't get it. I, I, I didn't say to, to, to qualify. No, to see how well you have been made. The house of God is the place you come and here you are the righteousness of God. You are holy. You are healed. You are prospered. You are delivered. This is the place where you see exactly how well his finished work has made you. And you believe that. And then you go away walking in that. Not focused on your sickness, but focused on how well he has made you. And if you focus on how well he has made you, that wellness will begin to manifest in your life. And you'll be walking free of things you couldn't get delivered of for 38 years. There are three essential things that happen, three, three essential occurrences that take place at this place of grace that God is purposed to happen here and every place of grace that he is reclaiming, whether that's the name or not. The first thing that happens here is the removal of legend and tradition that has been masquerading as truth. It is, it, is, it is the removal of legend and tradition that has been masquerading as truth. It's been masquerading as truth. See, all the people there thought that only the first person in could get well and Jesus comes and shows up and says you don't actually need the pool you don't need any of the people to help you get in it I can handle this all by myself me and my word can do this. 
So he, he removes, and, and watch it, because this is what is happening right now. Legend that has been masquerading as truth is being removed from the house of God. And some people can't handle it because they've been so comfortable in their legend that they can't actually handle Jesus when he shows up. The second essential thing that happens here is the revelation of ministry that understands the human condition yet challenges the human condition. It understands it, but it challenges it. Jesus has compassion for the state the man has been in. The Bible says he looked at him and the Bible says when he knew he had been struggling for 38 years. When he knew that he'd been ill, that when he knew he'd been struggling with addiction 38 years, struggling with perversion 38 years, struggling with homosexuality 38 years, struggling with lesbianism 38 years, when he knew, he said, I understand the condition. I'm not judging or condemning you for how you've lived. But do you want to be made well? Do you want to get better? See, this is the message that places of grace have to adopt. We have to adopt the message that tells me we understand where you are, but you can't stay that way if you're going to walk with us. We're not going to bring the doctrine down to your experience. We're going to say we understand how you've been living, but let us show you a more excellent way. And if you'll walk in the grace, you see, grace is the kingdom force. It is the only kingdom force that is empowered to deal with the condition you've been in a long time. See, you didn't get what I just said. Grace is empowered to deal with the condition you've been in a long time. Not even faith will change the condition you've been in a long time if it is not preceded by a revelation of grace. I'm going to say it again. Not even faith can deal with the condition you've been in a long time until it is preceded by a revelation of grace. Because as long as you don't believe you deserve it, you will never be able to contend for it. As long as you think it will only happen by your merit, then you will be knocked off of your faith confession. Jesus' faith gave you access to grace, not yours. Because if he hadn't done what he did, you could do all the believing you want. You wouldn't have any grace because the price wasn't paid. Are you still here? Through him also we have access by faith, Jesus' faith, into this grace in which we stand. I was reading this. And the Lord said to me, he said, son, you see that you stand in grace? I said, yes, sir. He said, and you walk by faith? I said, yes, sir. And then he said this to me, have you ever seen anybody who can walk before they can stand? Come on, stay with me. He said, you see this, son? I said, you stand in grace. Yes. You walk by faith. Yes. He said, have you ever seen anybody who can walk before they can stand? If you cannot stand, you cannot walk. Okay, try. I'll wait. I'll wait. Try. You look at me like, I mean, you don't even need a revelation for that. Try. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, this is why, although my people have been taught faith, much of it is not working for them. Because they are not standing in grace. They don't actually believe that what they confess they have a right to receive. They don't actually believe that what my word says they deserve because they're still trusting in their own ability. 
ability to get it and not my finished work and so if they're war walking by faith for six weeks and then they blow it and have a big mistake they feel like they go all the way back to square one and have to start over and God wants you to say no 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 you didn't get here because of your confession you got here because of my grace if you fall get up say it again you don't go back to square one we are moving on here Now see, when you understand that, it won't take you six months to get anything. It says in these...
there. Stay right there. He wants to hear from you. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, wonderful counselor, mighty God you are, the everlasting Father. The Prince of Priests, the Great I Am, we bless you. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. Whoa.
we bless you. We magnify you and we lift you up. Wonderful counselor, wonderful counselor, mighty God you are. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We magnify your name. We give you glory, Lord, and the honor to Come on, can you just lift your hands all over the building? We worship We magnify Come on, say we worship, we worship you. We magnify your name. We magnify your name. We give you glory. We give you glory, Lord. Give me honor. The honor to Wonderful counselor you are. We, we worship, worship you. We magnify your name. We
bless him. Come on and 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 magnify him. Come on and lift him up. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. Hallelujah. 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 H
wants to hear from you. Say glory to you. You say. Somebody lift up 
his name right here in this room, right where you are. Lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, get in his presence. He's here. You have to acknowledge that he's here. I mean, if he was right before you and you could see his face, because I can see his face. Come on, worship him. Tell him how good he is about what he's done for you. When you know you didn't deserve his goodness. When you were wallowing around in your filth and what you thought was best. He came, picked you up, dusted you off, washed you up, and gave you better. Gave me better than I could ever ask or think. God, you're wonderful. Lord, you're glorious and magnificent. There is nothing better than you. There is none larger and none greater. Lord, I bow before you and I lift you up. You are Elohim. You are El Shaddai. You are God most high. And I thank you, Lord, for loving me, for caring for me. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing for me now. Come on, somebody, make it personal. Make it personal, what he's doing for you right now. Thank you, God. In this day and in this hour, you are re-weaponizing me. As I'm recommitting and rededicating myself to you. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We give you praise and honor and glory and majesty for it is yours and yours alone. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, we come before you. Thank you, Lord. Now from your heart, somebody give God a good amen right there. Amen. Amen and amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome here to the place of grace, a place where whoever can come and be healed of whatever, amen. Here in this structure, right where you are in your living room, wherever you are in your car, that could be that place of grace. Allow the spirit of grace to come in and he'll heal you of whatever. There is no sickness or disease that he cannot heal. There's no situation or circumstance that he cannot and will not penetrate and make it better. All we have to do is receive his goodness right where you are in your living room, in your kitchen, your car, or if you're sitting on your front porch listening to this. God is able. He's willing. If you would just lift up your hands, lift up your spirit and receive all his goodness again. Welcome, welcome, welcome here to the Place of Grace. On behalf of the Prophet Bishop Clarence E. McClendon, the Place of Grace as a whole, and our First Lady, Lady Priscilla McClendon, welcome, welcome, welcome here today. If you're here in this sanctuary for the very first time, could you just wave this way? Amen. Just say amen. There's one there. Amen. There's another. Amen. There's one back there for the very first time visitors. Come on. Place of Grace family. Welcome our first time visitors all around this place. I know there's a couple more in here. Just wave this way. It's okay. We're not going to ask you for a thing. Someone's coming to you to, to give you something. It's a gift from the prophet. He wants to make sure that you get a gift. It's not an accident or an incident that you are here, but it is by the divine design of Christ Jesus. We've been praying for you, asking God to send you this way to connect with this man and this ministry and the assignment on his life. Amen. Come on. Uh, there had, there's a, 
our welcoming, uh, sorry, our welcoming committee, <laughs> our care team coming to you. There's a hand over here, our first time uh, person here, Ken Luck. Our care team, can you get a gift in her hand? I don't see anybody moving to thank you there. Amen. Amen. I want to make sure you get that gift. If the prophet asks me, yes, sir, we got that gift into their hand. If you're joining us for the very first time out there, wherever you are, know that it is not an accident or an incident that you are here. But again, we've been praying for you as well, asking God to send you this way to connect with this man, the ministry, and the assignment on his life. Why? Because God has something for you. And he's going to get it to you through a prophet or man or woman of God that he's placed in this earth for the assignment. The assignment that's on their life is to get from them and it into your life what God has for you. So welcome, welcome again, all of our first time visitors, those joining us here in the sanctuary and those out there online, wherever you are. And for all of our people. PEC partners, we're our PEC partners, everybody that's connected in this house, amen, is up here, every hand should be up around here, just about, you are welcome, welcome, welcome to you as well, all of our partners in this sanctuary and around the world as a whole, again, it's because of you that all of this is possible, it's possible, all the cameras, the people that are here for the very first time, those out there joining us for the first time, being able to see this. Again, it's because of you, PEC partners. You're sowing, you're giving, your prayers, your alms, all of it. It is because of you being obedient to God and to what he's saying um, to you about praying with the man of God, about giving into this ministry and the assignment on this life. So thank God for you and we pray God's best for you and may you continue to prosper in everything that you do god bless you welcome 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 our pec partners all around this place come on put your hands together for the pec and if you're still wondering what the pec is it is the prophetic e-community those again those that have determined to join with the prophet not just in their prayers but also in their giving there are assignments that come out, things that the man of God is, has heard from God, that he gets this information to his partners. The partners come together, they pray, they believe, they sow, and we begin to move in the direction that God is leading us in. Amen. Thank God for you, PEC partners. Someone said, how can I become a partner with the Clarence E. McClendon ministry team? You can go online at bishopmcclendon.com. Click on that menu button. The first thing you see pop up there will be PEC. Fill out that short information there, and that's it. Now it's up to the prophet to get in touch with you. Whatever information it is, if it's telephone number, um, text, email, whatever it is, however, or whatever it is to stay in contact with you or the best way to get in contact with you, put that information in there. And again, it, that's it for you. And the man of God will be in contact with you. Thank God again for our PEC partners. Again, if you want to become a PEC partner, bishopmcclendon.com. Click on that menu button and fill out that PEC information. And don't forget to stay connected. Stay connected. Somebody, don't you know how important it is? Connection is important. Amen. Those that you connect with a lot of times will steer your life for the better or for the worse. You know, do you, don't you know if you hang around criminals, although you may not commit a crime, you could go to jail for, you know, guilty by association. I've been there a lot. Get, got picked up right here in this city, hanging around some people I shouldn't have been hanging around. Just because you're connected with them, you get picked up too. So if you connect with the right people, you, God can pick you up and will pick you up. Amen. So stay connected with the prophet on all of the social media outlets. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, all at Bishop McClendon. And also download the Bishop McClendon Lifestyle app. Download that app at your Google, your Play Store, your App Store, whatever device that you may have. Download the Bishop McClendon Lifestyle app there as well. And also YouTube. When you go to YouTube, like that or subscribe to that YouTube channel. 
as well okay just hit that subscribe button and again that more it's out there these things the more of us that click on that button that subscribe to it it makes it available to other people to people that you don't know haven't you been on your social media pages and stuff pop up like why did I get this it's because so many people that you know or may know have clicked on it or like it now that's why you're seeing it so if you want to get this word out and we're we're commanded by the word of God to get the gospel into the world and this is another way to do that amen this is another way if, you, if you're just thinking oh I can go to it whenever I want to what about the others what about someone else that has not heard so subscribe to that YouTube channel as well on, on all of, excuse me, all of the social media outlets as well. If you like it and you're seeing, the more you watch it, the more other the people will get an opportunity to see it as well. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, all at Bishop McClendon. And also subscribe to the YouTube channel. And also you can download the Bishop McClendon Lifestyle app. Ooh, that is a lot. I'm running out of breath up here, y'all. Somebody got to help a brother out. Amen. Eyes on the watchmen. Who's seen it? Raise your hand. Amen. Talk, speaking of social media, eyes on the watchmen. Our prophet is out there every Thursday and Friday. It's going to continue this Thursday and Friday, 12 p.m. 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So adjust your clock. If you're on the East Coast, that's somewhere around 3 o'clock for you. The Midwest could be... It, what is that, 2 o'clock? And mountain time is, um, what did I say, 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Amen? So wherever you are, and if you're Great Britain or you're on the continent somewhere in Nigeria or Libya or something, again, that's about eight hours forward for you. So midnight, wake up. Again, the watchman's no, the watchman doesn't sleep. <laughs> At midnight, yeah. Anyhow, eyes on the watchman. The prophet is teaching in this area of the watchman. It is important for us, especially in this hour, in this moment, in this time of, reded of dedication, as we dedicate unto the Lord. He is going to weaponize his people. And one of those ways that he's going to do that is to gain watchmen to stand on the wall to see what, to see what's coming forward to see what's coming at us. If you know what's coming, you can better protect yourself. Amen. If you are, if a car is coming at you head on, you know you can swing to the left or the right. But if you have your eyes closed while you're driving, how are you to see? Or if you're blindfolded, how are you to see? Don't be blinded by all of today's things that are going on around us. Don't let these things blind you. How can I do that? How can I not let it blind? You can get the information on the eyes of the watchman this Thursday, Friday, 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And again, it's exclusively online, not here in the sanctuary. So go to YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of those. Again, another way to get it, another way to see it. And you can also see it on the uh, Bishop McClendon Lifestyle app as well. And you can always, and for those of you, you're working, because I know during some of those times I'm at work, I can't see it at that moment. But these things are important. You can go back and review it afterwards. You can see it on the replay. It's always there for you. That's another good thing about social media and all of these things that you can always go back and see it later. You know, when you get the time, when you're settled, once you put the kids down, did their homework, got them settled in bed, take that hour and dedicate some time unto God and get the information that you need for your spirit so that you might be better, that you and I might be better. Amen. Amen. You can clap for that. Amen. Celebrate for someone else. It's a good thing. If you haven't seen the eyes of the watchman, let me encourage you to do so. It is good. Man, it's food for your soul and it will it strengthens us from the inside out. And it opens your eyes to see. It will open your eyes. Now you become you're able to see all 
some of the trickery going on around you. Those things that people that I can't, I'm not going to say that. That people want you to see. The devil in himself, should I say. The spirit of the enemy wants you to see something other than what God has already determined. So watch the eyes of the watchman on Thursday, this Thursday and Friday, 12 p.m. Amen? Amen. You guys agree with that one as well. Prayer Force Prayer Hour. Prayer Force Prayer Hour is this Friday, March the 1st at 4. Amen. Prayer Force Prayer Hour. This Friday, March the 1st, 7.14 p.m., 7.14 Pacific Standard Time. Join us here, man of God. These are instructions. Again, these are the instructions that come out of the Spirit of God to our man of God. That we come together, amen, as collectively that we come together and pray and pray once a month. This is just the, on the first day of the month. So it's going to be March the 1st at 7.14 p.m. We'll be here live in the sanctuary. If you can come and be a part of that in the sanctuary, come. Be a part of the prayer force prayer hour here in the sanctuary. But if you cannot, if you can't make it from New York and then get back to work on time, then join us online. Amen. You can join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It will be broadcast on all the social media outlets. But if you're here in the city, in the county of Los Angeles, you can make it to this prayer force prayer hour. I know 7 o'clock, that's kind of during traffic time in L.A. But we'll go through traffic to get to anything else. Amen. So let's go through traffic to get to and closer to God, if we will. People need to, we got to show up at the house of the Lord. People, have, we've gotten used to all the social media, and it's good. It really, really is good. I love social media. I could sit in the bed in the middle of the night, 9, 10 o'clock at night, put, put on the prophet and get some things that I didn't get earlier. Or I was at work. I could get these. I could see eyes of the watchman at 9 p.m. But there are times when you have to come together, that we have to come together corporately. According to the scripture, there is strength in numbers. Somebody said, where does it say that? It says a threefold cord is not easily broken. So if there's just a cord that just has one strand, it can't hold as much weight. But a threefold cord is not easily broken. Again, in scripture, it says one can put a thousand to flight. Two could put 10,000 to flight. What do you think it does when we come together corporately and there's 200, 400, 500 people in here praying and believing God? Things happen instantly. Things happen instantly. That's the third dimension. Thing that we're doing here that's third dimension worship so come be a part of the prayer force prayer hour this friday march the 1st at 7 14 p.m pacific standard time here in the sanctuary 2543 west manchester boulevard if you can get here get here uh, or if not then we'll it will be streamed online on all the social media outlets so come be a part of that amen we're going to put you back into the hands of our worship arts team. Amen. God bless you, Pastor Black. Amen. Hallelujah. We've come to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Because he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. See? 
nobody greater. There's nobody greater. None greater than our God. He's the greatest, the strongest, the wisest, the best friend we'll ever have. Hallelujah to the greatest one. There's nobody greater. No, can we sing a little bit of that? Nobody greater. There's none greater, no name above Jesus. Hallelujah, nobody greater than our God. Hallelujah. Can you just worship him for a little moment? Just for being good. For granting us another day of life. With full mobility of our limbs. Clothed in our right mind. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We have a reason to celebrate him. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, just worship him just a little more. Above all names, above all names. He's, worthy He's worthy of all praise. Say, mighty are the works of your hand. Mighty are the works of your hand. Say, mighty are the works of your hand. Mighty are the works of your hand. Say, He's the name above all names.
of your hand Nobody greater Nobody greater Nobody greater than me Come on, say that together Nobody greater Nobody greater Nobody greater than you Nobody great. Nobody great. No, no, no. Nobody great. Nobody great. Nobody great than you. Yeah, yeah. Come on, just say that a couple more times. Nobody great. Nobody great. Nobody great. Yeah, nobody great. Nobody great than you. Yeah. What a privilege it is to worship Jesus. Nobody great. Nobody great. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. Oh, we decree and we declare there's no nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody, nobody greater than you. Yeah. Say nobody. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. celebrate him can you worship him praise him it's all about Jesus hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah glory to Jesus glory to Jesus
This is not just a song. This is a spiritual reality. Something supernatural happens when the righteous rejoice and when they praise. Look at your other neighbor, tell them the Bible says when the righteous rejoice, there is great glory. Look at your other neighbor because that one's not listening to you very much. Tell them, and the Bible also lets us know in 2 Chronicles 20, when the people of God began to praise, the Bible declares that God sent ambushments against the people of Moab, of Ammon, and Mount Seir. These were the enemies of God's people. And God told his children, you will not have to fight in this battle. He said, but you will have to get in position. Look at your neighbor and say, this is the position of the righteous. It's the position of praise. Now tell them, when you begin to pray, something happens in the heavenly realm. I want you to look at three people and tell them you can fix it in the next 15 minutes. Come on, say, there's a... is shifting as you're praising in my, in my direction. Come on, children. There's a breaking in my favor. Say, in my favor, there's a breaking in my In my favor, there's a breaking in my Grab your neighbor's hand. And I'm there's a breaking in my, in my, 
Put your hands together, open your mouth, and give thanks to God. of your word for your word is truth for the intelligent Holy Spirit who is with us and in us he is the great teacher lead us today further into truth and grant us that for having been in your presence we are bettered empowered illuminated Perfume the saints again, my Father, I pray, with the spirit of victory. For you said we are the aroma of Christ, both to them that are saved and perished. We ask this, believing we receive it, and thanking you that we have it, in the name of Jesus. And everyone who agreed with the man of God said, it is so. Now say amen. Clap holy hands and bless the Lord, my King. Hallelujah. You may be seated. There is no substitute for the presence of God. I'm going to say that again. There is no substitute for the presence of God. The presence of God all the difference. We greet you today in the strong name of Jesus, reminding you that he is Lord and there is none other beside him. I'm getting a little echo here. I know you'll fix it. I don't know what's going on, but if you can fix it, it will help me greatly. Thank you. And we greet you once again in the strong name of Jesus. Grab your neighbor's hand, squeeze it tight, and tell them we have no song services in this house. We worship God. Look at your other neighbor and say, don't ever waste your praise. Something supernatural happens when the people of God praise. You are to expect something to happen when you praise the Lord. Clap your hands and say, 
psalmist wrote, he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his. Then he said, watch this, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Look at your neighbor and say, this thing comes with benefits. Yeah, 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 bless the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. If you study that out in the original Hebrew, it actually means the response or requital. In other words, God says, when you praise me, expect a response. Are you there? Amen. I see some people I haven't seen in years. Look at you. Where, where you been? Wow. I'm glad. What? On a mission. Wow. She she is a she, wow. I, I way back on La Brea. She, and you too. Weren't you in the choir? You're new. Why ain't talking to you right now then? But no, no, no. No, <laughs> no she she she's she's new. See, this is very interesting because I got I got a lot of stuff to do so but I, I sometimes I, my spirit is drawn to people when I came here I saw and I said wait she looks familiar and see I've never been much of a pastor I've already told you all that I'm you know shepherds I'm not really a shepherd I'm a prophet but but and that's a different gifting but and, and what happens to me is sometimes I won't know people are gone for sometime after they're gone and then they'll come up in my spirit and I'll pray and I had just I had just this is very interesting I had just watched a video of us back on the break and I saw both of you I saw both of you you were in the choir the night we recorded yeah I remember that and so I saw them and to see you here is a blessing Thank God. And you're new. Say it again. You asked her to. You've been watching me. Have I been behaving okay? I've been doing, all right. Praise the Lord. Listen. Clap your hands and thank the Lord for them all. We appreciate you. I'm glad you're all here in Jesus' name. Listen. A lot of things are going on. I got to hurry with it. I got to hurry with what I have to do today. Uh, but I want to remind you that, and I know you've already been reminded, but I want to add my reminder to you because it is a directive of the Lord and it's important. And you've been participating, but I cannot overemphasize the significance of this. Our uh, first day of the month prayer time, our prayer force prayer hour, every first day of every month, the Spirit of the Lord directed us to have a time of prayer on the first day, not the first Sunday, not the first Monday, the first day of every month, no matter what it is. And he, he told me that that time of prayer would be a first fruit of a type on every single month, that if we would gather together and pray, see that there's a principle in Bible, in the scripture of first fruit. The Bible says, if the first be holy, then the whole lump is holy. And, and it's a principle. That's why God tells you to bring his first because he says, when you honor me, I receive everything else. And I bless everything you bring me if you bring me the first. And so he said to me, I want you to lead the people in a time of prayer on the first day of every month. He said, because there are some things that I have purpose to do and escalate some things and the people are going to have to come together. And so I want to encourage you to be with us. So the first is this Friday. And I know in Los Angeles, Friday is a time where people uh, literally need prayer after they get off the freeway. So I want to encourage you to make sure that you give yourself time to come because it's important to be there. Look at your neighbor. Say, don't pray about coming to prayer. Just be there. You're going to, I'll pray about, no, no, don't pray about coming to prayer. Just, just, just come. All right. So make sure that you're here. That will be prayer force prayer. Hour. It starts at 714 p.m. to remind us of the exhortation in 2 Chronicles 714. If my people 
who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. God said, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. There's a lot of things going on in the earth, and not only do people need healing, but the land needs healing. There's a revelation there that we will, we've talked about, we'll deal with again. So meet me this coming Friday uh, on, uh, at 7, 14 p.m. I'll be leading the time of prayer. Now, uh, I want you to be prepared. The Lord spoke to me concerning this back in the month of uh, November of last year. December, I think I shared it with our team and I was waiting for the time and the Spirit of the Lord uh, said to me, the time is now. And of course, every six to eight weeks here at the Place of Grace, we do what is called a prophetic encounter. It's a time of study in the Word. We don't do a midweek service here because the Lord directed us not to for several reasons, not the least of which is my uh, uh, you know, apostolic and prophetic itinerary that keeps me going and moving all the time and it's tough to maintain. So the Lord said to me that we were to do two or three nights every six to eight weeks and we come together around the word of God. Now what I'm getting ready to do is not a prophetic encounter although it will sit in the same modality it will only be online I'm going to do it only online and I was directed to do this but the spirit of the Lord spoke in my spirit about three uh, three days three days of your financial breakthrough he said to me that there's a financial breakthrough that he has purpose for his people. Don't look at me strange. Look at me with understanding hearts. Listen, remember, anything that is significant to you is significant to God. It's always interesting to me if I talk about, you know, your, fi your physical healing, if I talk about uh, your family healing, if I talk about your emotional healing, saints get excited. You start talking about your financial healing and they get tight. Are you still here? But everything that concerns God, everything that concerns you concerns God. And he has made a way for every need of the lives of his people to be met. But it's not met by accident. It's met by divine principle. Are you still here? Uh, and I, I'm going to expand on this a little more, but March 3, uh, th 3 um, on, on Sunday, uh, next Sunday, I'm going to be sharing in this area. And then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, March 6, 7, 8. And I'm telling you, when the Lord said this to me, he, said, he told me three things that I was to teach you specifically because he has set you up for a season of financial increase and breakthrough. Now, I'm not making this up, and God knows I don't need anything else to do. You understand? But he spoke in my spirit to do this, so it's going to be exclusively online. Now, there's another time of ministry coming up that we will have as a prophetic encounter because I've got to finish that series on uh, gender, uh, paternity, and sexuality. We were teaching on GPS and I haven't gotten to the S. <laughs> uh, the holidays came right while I was about to get to the S and we had all this stuff to do and so I'll, I'll, pick, I'll, I'll pick it up and oh, 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 we're going to do that as the next prophetic encounter and I promise you, you're going to want to be a part of that you're going to want to hear it because God has some things to say to us that are going to um, they're, they're going to uh, encourage because see, I'm going to teach you what the Bible says I'm not going to teach you what religion has taught you and look at your neighbor and say that's dangerous isn't it that's dangerous yeah I'm going to teach you what the Bible says and I'm going to show you why the Bible says what it says and I'm going to show you how this how religion through its attempt to restrain you has actually empowered wickedness. Uh, and it's a divine principle in scripture. Uh, 
let, 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 let me just give let me just give you let me just give you a foretaste. See, one of the things that traditional religion has attempted to enforce is the fact that marriage is between one man and one woman. That's not biblical. The Bible doesn't say that. It's religious and it's traditional, but it's not biblical. Now, there he go. I knew, I always knew there was something wrong with him. No, I'm not suggesting either that polygamy is the will of God. What I'm saying is the Bible hasn't told, the Bible hasn't said what preachers have said. Y'all aren't saying anything to me. And because, the, because preachers have said things the Bible hasn't said, when the world starts interpreting things differently than we believe, we have no foot to stand on because what we've said already isn't scriptural. Y'all aren't saying anything to me. Y'all ain't. Uh, so what about Adam and Eve? Adam only had one choice. Stop. Okay, so, 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 and, 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 and the 12 tribes of Israel were the product of the offspring of four different women. And God calls them holy. Okay, not today, but we're going to get into that. So, so, so look at your neighbor and say, stay tuned. These things and more will be explained to you in the next prophetic encounter with Bishop Clarence E. All right, so I want you to make sure that you are here because it's going to be a time of insight and revelation in the Word of God. But next week, next week, somebody say, I wish you would do that today, Bishop. Good Lord. Uh, next week. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help us all. Um, uh, but next week, I'm going to be dealing with this area, Wednesday, March 6, 7, 8. And the Lord gave me three things that he told me I'm to teach you and prepare you for to get you ready for a season of breakthrough and increase. And remember, remember this, when God has purpose to bless and increase you, it is not just so you can get everything you want and everything you desire it is the, the covenant is that you and I are blessed to be a blessing are you there are you there and God I said this years ago that God is going to bring some of his people to the point where we realize that some of the things that come to us aren't even for us so, 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 you're not listening to me see when God knows he can trust you he will actually give you things as custodians for others because he knows you'll get it where he, he wants it to go some of you are going to get cars that aren't even for you y'all aren't hearing see that's why when people say well you're talking about houses and lands well what if God gives me houses and I give you one you won't be mad about it then right you understand what I'm saying? So, 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 so one thing, one, see, one of the things I've learned, especially when it comes to this area, people will always attribute to you what their disposition would be if they were in your shoes. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. But, but for God to bless and prosper you, he first has to kill some things in you. That's another lesson. But, but, but as I was praying for you this week, uh, turn to Numbers 11 real quick. As I was praying for you this week, and not a week goes by where I do not pray for the financial, the economic, the material prosperity of the people connected to this anointing. Why? Because I know that it is God's methodology to prosper his people so that they can be a blessing to the earth and to creation. Are you still here? I said, are you still here? So not a week goes by and it, I'm amazed at what is in the scripture when the spirit of God will show it to you. Go to Numbers 11. I'm going to read a little bit here because this is important. Numbers 11, and I was praying for you. And, and one thing I am absolutely certain of is God has your increase on his mind. He, I'm telling you, he has blessing and increasing you on his mind. And when I asked him concerning you this week, 
he, he, he directed me here and he said, I want to show you something and I want you to share it with my people. Look at Numbers 11, verse number one. Now, this is about the children of Israel. They're out of the bondage of Egypt. They are now in the wilderness wandering. They're being fed with manna uh, on a daily basis. And remember, manna means what is it? Are you there? See, the Bible says when they saw the bread come down from heaven, they called it manna because they didn't know what it was. And manna means what is it? Part of the revelation there is while the children of Israel were being sustained in the wilderness with manna, they were having provision, but they were eating in ignorance. In, in other words, God was providing for them, but they didn't know how. And see, provision in ignorance will only take you so far. As a matter of fact, provision in ignorance will never satisfy the fullness of the prosperity you need. That's why what you're, what you're about to see is even though the children of Israel were being fed with manna, they got tired of the manna. They got tired of the miracle. Y'all aren't hearing me because the miracle wasn't satisfying the totality of their need. Are you still here? See, and it's, gotten, it's not God's will for you and I to live from miracle to miracle. It's God's will for you and I to live in a flow of supernatural provision, not just miracle to miracle. Wave at me if you understand what I just said. Look at verse number one. It says, so now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them in the outskirts of the camp. Then Moses cried out to, then the people cried out to Moses. And when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. Go down to verse number four. It says, now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And everybody look right up here at me. What they forgot is they were slaves. They were being beat and oppressed. See, there is some degree of security in bondage. Because in bondage, they were being fed regularly. Ain't nobody saying nothing to me. Which is why a lot of people, when they come into the kingdom of God, if they don't learn how to prosper in the kingdom, they'll go back to the world. And the world system, even though there's bondage, at least they were getting their car note paid. Ain't nobody saying nothing to me. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, let me not go there. Okay, I'm not going there. Okay. Uh, Look at verse number, number six. But now our whole being is dried up and there is nothing at all except this miracle bread. Are you there? Now look at verse number seven. Now the manna was like coriander seed and its color like the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it on the ground and beat it into bread. And go down to verse number 10. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at his door in the tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? <laughs> Did I conceive that this is a pastor's prayer room when, when provision is needed? Watch. He says, he says, did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep all over me. I think Moses had a little ethnic in him. For they weep all over me. Give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all these people alone the burden is too heavy for me now watch this he says if you treat me like this please kill me here and now if I have found favor in your sight in other words he said if you love me kill me and don't let me see my wretchedness." now what is he speaking to he's speaking to the pressure 
of having to provide was so great that if it's going to be like this, just take me out of here. This is what financial pressure and material pressure can put even on the most righteous of people. That's why God wants you to know how to do this and not just go from jam to jam. Are you still here? Now watch this. Nudge your neighbor say, pay attention. He's going somewhere with this. So the Lord said to Moses, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Uh, bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you and I will take up the spirit that is upon you and will the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not have to bear it alone. Now the, what happens, Moses brings the 70, the spirit of God falls on them and they all begin to prophesy 68 of them came two stayed in the house they didn't come to the meeting but the bible says even though they didn't come to the meeting they began to prophesy in the houses they were in because moses had chosen them and god honored moses choice there's a whole lot in that but i don't have time to read it all are you still here i said are you still here uh, and, and, and Moses said, look at verse 21, the people whom I am among are 600,000 men on foot. That's not counting women and children. Yet you have said, well, let me, I'm trying to skip. Let me go up. Let me read this. He says, verse 17, he says, I will take up the spirit that's on you, put the same on them. Look at verse 18. Then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourself tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat? Look at verse 19. You shall eat not one day, not two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. In other words, like I said, God said, I'm going to give you so much meat, you're going to get tired of eating meat. Are you there? In other words, He's demonstrating, I'm a God of abundance. There's no shortage with me. Are you there? And Moses said to the people, verse 21, there are 600,000 men. That's not counting women and children. Look at God's response in verse 23. And the Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen or not. So Moses went out and told the people, the words of the Lord. Look at verse 25. Then the Lord came down in the cloud. You say, Bishop, you're reading a lot because all of it's important. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took up the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did it again. Go down to verse number 31. Now a wind went out from the Lord and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp about a day's journey on this side and about a day's journey on the other side all around the camp and about two cubits above the surface of the ground. In other words, they were stacked. They had so much, they had so many birds. They were stacked on top of each other, two cubits from the ground. That's about two elbow lengths from elbow to here. So about five feet off the ground were just birds. Now here's what I want you to see because it's very interesting that when Moses speaks to God about the need for provision God's answer is get me 70 of the elders and I'm going to take of the spirit that's on you and put it on them and the Bible says when God took of the spirit that was on Moses and put it on them they all they all what say it out loud they all prophesied and when they began to prophesy the Lord sent quail don't miss the principle when they began to speak, provision began to come to their circumstance. 
to their situation. God's answer to provision was prophesied. Y'all, 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 okay, okay, okay. Some of you, some of you are looking at me like I'm from another world. I am. Well, watch this. Uh, go, go with me real quickly. Just, just, just give me, a, just give me a second here, cause there's something here you have to see. Go to Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 14. Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 14 says, "A man will be satisfied with." good by the fruit of his mouth and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered unto him. I was reading this some time ago and the spirit of the Lord said, he said, son, pay attention. He said, the child of God does not live hand to mouth. The child of God lives mouth to hand. You didn't See, it is the exact opposite of the world. The world lives hand to mouth. They work and they are provided for. In the kingdom, your provision is not connected only to your work. That's why when God is going to increase you, he doesn't talk to you about getting another job. You're not listening to the preacher. I've said it to you a thousand times. I'll say it again. Nowhere in your Bible do you see the words job, gyra. Because your job was never intended to meet your need. Look at your neighbor and tell them your job was never intended to meet your need. Not ever. God is your provider. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, your provider. The Lord, your source. Are you still here? So the child of God doesn't live hand to mouth. He lives mouth to hand. What you and I receive in this kingdom is connected to what we say. And that's what God was demonstrating to the children of Israel. You, if you'll start speaking correctly, you'll start seeing more. All right, one more. Nudge your neighbor say, one more. Go to Mark eleven twenty two. 22. And 24. Ah. Go there real quick. Mark 11, 22 and 24. Now remember what's happened before Mark 11, 22. Jesus, on the day before with his disciples, was walking by, saw a fig tree. He was hungry, the Bible says. He came to get some fruit off the fig tree to eat it. When he got there, there was nothing there. And Jesus said, no man eat fruit of you forever hereafter and went on into Jerusalem. The next day, on the way back with his disciples, leaving Jerusalem, going back to Bethany, they go the same route and the disciples see the tree Jesus spoke to yesterday. Somebody say yesterday. So 24 hours max. They see the tree Jesus spoke to yesterday dried up from the roots. And they are amazed. And this is when Jesus looks at them in, 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 in Mark eleven twenty two, 22 and says, Have faith in God which is actually a wrong translation of the original Greek the original Greek actually says have the faith of God have God's kind of faith use your faith like God does you have been given access to the God level of faith use it what he was just saying is I just used the God kind of faith to teach you what happens when a child of God speaks and believes what he says. Now watch this. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes the things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says says therefore I say to you whatever things you ask or desire when you pray 
believe that you receive them and you will have them. What is Jesus saying? I just demonstrated to you the God kind of faith. I spoke something and in 24 hours I received what I said. And therefore I am trying to teach you. Now watch this. I'm trying to teach you to get your saying and your praying in agreement so that your saying doesn't cancel out your praying you know you missed it he said that's why I say to you what things soever you desire when you pray when you pray believe you receive them not when you see them believe you receive them when you pray believe you receive them now if you believe you receive them when you pray you will leave prayer saying I have it and if you leave prayer saying I have it you'll have it you'll see it come to pass but he says if you ask Lord meet my need Lord I need a hundred thousand dollars by the end of the month God says, okay, when you, when, you, when you ask me, believe you receive it. So what am I doing? I'm saying, you know what? I have $100,000. I got to start planning what to do. Do, do, do. Well, do you have it? Yeah, yeah, I have it. Well, where is it? Well, you can't see it yet, but I have it. Well, show it to me. Well, I can't show it to you yet, but I have it. Are you there? Are you there? Look at your neighbor and say, prophesy it. Notice what Jesus said. And this is what Christians miss. He said, I've just told you, whosoever says to this mountain, be thou removed, and shall not down his heart, but believe the things he says, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, now watch it, what things whatever you desire when you pray, believe you receive and you will have. What is the instruction? I'm trying to teach you to get your praying and your saying in agreement. Because ultimately, if you're not saying you have what you prayed for, your saying will cancel out your praying. See, Jesus didn't, he, he just said a powerful thing. He told you, you will not necessarily have what you pray for. You will have what you say. Now, if you pray for it and say you have it, then you'll have it. If you pray for it and say you don't have it, your saying will cancel your praying. And I just told you, you're going to have what you say. Most Christians, their saying cancels their praying because they have not disciplined themselves to say what Jesus says. Lay your hand on your brother, lay your hand on your sister and tell them whatever you do, don't forget this because God has plans in the next 30 days in the next 60 days in the next 90 days to increase you so whatever you do don't forget this your provision ultimately is not a matter of prayer it's a matter of faith speaking what you believe look at your neighbor and say don't miss this your provision is not a matter of your facts it is a matter of your faith your facts may say you don't have it your faith says it's yours if you ask and believe you receive you'll have it well, how's that gonna happen that is not my business God will get it honest He won't rob anybody. 
He won't steal from anybody. He'll get it legally. Grab your neighbor. I feel the Holy Ghost. I got to hurry. Grab your neighbor's hand and say, I don't know how it's going to happen. But if you say so, it will surely come to pass. And that's not my word. That's Jesus' word. Now, I used to have to believe that. I don't have to believe it anymore. I've seen it happen too many times. I'm in this building because I said so, along with some of you. <laughs> Woo! I told the Lord when he told me to say this, and I said, Lord, it's going to take too long. He said, say what I said. Lay your hand on somebody. Lay your hand on them. And tell them, if you hear nothing else today, God has purpose to increase you. Keep your hand on them. Tell them, these struggles you've been having, this is going to be the last season of struggle you have if you'll put what you're being taught to work. That's faith rising in you right there. Somebody just got an answer. Hey! I love it. Somebody just got a solution. Now prophesy to them, tell them you will see it in not many days. the Word of God. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, God, whether they are here or listening to me somewhere else. Lord, you know I'm only saying what you told me. And you let me know it is your plan to increase your people in this season. Now I pray in the name of Jesus for every man, woman, boy and girl, every household, every dream, every vision, every project that you have purposed that there be no lack as your people put your principles to work. For it is not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. It is so in Jesus' name. If you believe you receive, clap your hands and thank the Lord. Right there, we're getting ready to worship the Lord in our giving. And so I want you to participate in this. If you're watching me live streaming, I want you to get in on this. There is no time or distance in the realm of the Spirit. The God who is present with us is there with you. And His Word has come to you. The, the Bible says he sent his word and healed them. Right there on your computer screen, right there on your smartphone, there's a donate button. There's a way for you to sow. I want you to sow as God has directed you. If you're a tither, you know what to do. I'm a tither. And according to God's word, a tenth of everything that comes into my hands and yours as a child of God belongs to him. Some would say, well now, Bishop, tithing isn't new covenant. Tithing is before there was any covenant. Tithing is neither old covenant or new covenant. It is before there is ever a covenant. Amen. And it is a basic foundational principle. It's the blessing principle of God. And so I encourage you to put God's word to work. But maybe you're giving some other way. Maybe you're sowing in the prophet seed. Maybe God has already increased you and you're bringing him a first fruit to say, God, I thank you for the increase. Here's something from that increase. And I'm going 
to go to sow again because I want the increase to continue. Right there on your computer screen, your smartphone, there's a donate button. There's a way for you to sow. I want you to click it and sow as God has directed you. Or you can text CEMM to 41444. Just follow the prompts. There's a number on your screen, 310-323-2600. I've got trained prayer ministers ready to agree with you. Now listen to me. If you never sow a dime here, we're going to pray for you because God has called us to pray for you. But I encourage you to mix your faith and your giving. Acts chapter 10 teaches us what happens when faith and giving are joined. 310-323-2600. If you've got a prayer need, let my prayer ministers pray for you. The same anointing that's on me is on them and they'll agree with you in prayer. Call the number right now. Now, if you've got the Bishop McClendon app, that's an easy way for you to give. If you don't have it, you can go to Google or iTunes, download it. And that's a way not only for you to give, but for you to stay connected. So it'll bless you. Go and do it today. Now, if you're in the tabernacle and you are giving, if you are making out a check, make it payable to C-E-M-M, -M, Clarence E. McClendon Ministries. If you're giving cash, the envelope is for the cash. Please use it. And if you desire to do this on a bank or credit card, there are people in the aisle ready to assist you so you don't have to take a long time and write a bunch of things just get up right now and go right there they'll greet you with a smile and I know you'll be blessed as you act on whatever the Spirit of God is directing you to do now here's what I want to do I want to pray for you if you have given if you are giving even if you're not finished giving yet I believe you'll continue after I pray but I want you to lift up your hands with me and let's agree say this out loud say Lord you are my source you are my provider and you have shown me in your word the principles of increase and prospering I declare my need is met I decree I am living in abundance you gotta say so say it I am living in abundance I am increasing more and more, not only to be blessed, but to be a blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Come on, let's worship God. Let's do it with faith. Then you can ask what you will. If you abide in me, if you abide, these are the words of Jesus. He said this, and my word abides. Then you shall ask what you will, and it shall be given to you. We believe and we receive. We are blessed to be a blessing. If you've given, if you've given, worship the Lord with us. Come on, say, if you abide, Jesus said, then you shall ask what you will. 
and it will be given. I believe I receive it in the name of Jesus. You abide in and my word. Then you shall ask what you will, and it shall. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to thank you for sitting next to me. You're about to receive a very special time of ministry. The Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, the bishop has taught us this. Some songs we sing to God. Other songs we sing to one another. See, 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 the Bible, we're saying if you abide, you're not singing that to God. You're singing that to your brother, your sister. So look at him and tell him you're about to receive a very special presentation, a very special ministry in music. I'm going to sing to you. Ready? Here we go. Your neighbor and my word abide. Jesus said, Then what you will, and it shall be given. Tell him, Jesus said, This if you abide in me and my word abide in you, then you shall ask what you will. And it shall be. Now tell your neighbor, Jesus said this. Jesus said this. Take me up one more time, say. If you abide in me. And my word abide in you. Then you shall ask what you will. And Jesus said. It is the Father's good pleasure Jesus to give you the kingdom. And my word of in you. Then you shall ask what you will. And it shall be. Then you shall ask what you will. Then you what you will. And it shall be. Then you shall ask what you will. And it shall be, say it one more time, then you shall ask what you will, what you will, Now if you receive that and believe that, thank God for it, for it is his word. Hallelujah. We receive it. Just nudge your neighbor and say, You got it, you got it, you got it. The Bible, the Bible says, and this is the confidence. The Bible says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we desire, then we know we have what we've asked of him. Isn't that a magnificent promise? Wow. What a God we serve. Quickly, give me 30 minutes. Uh, how many of you give me 30 minutes? 30, 60, 90. <laughs> keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Uh, as always, when I get to the conclusion of the month, thank God for these musicians and singers, will you? Amen. As always, when I get to the conclusion of what we call Vision Month here at the Place of Grace and every February, 
we call it Vision Month, and we dedicate our attention to the vision of the house. That is what God has specifically instructed us as a people that we are to be and do, become and manifest. And once again, the significance of vision again is that we are to weigh ourselves against the vision that God gives us because it is by the fulfillment of vision that God measures success. It is not by numbers, it's not by money, it's not by how many of this, it's by the fulfillment of purpose. If you are going to hear God say, well done, it is not because you were famous or rich or powerful, it's because you caught his vision for your life and fulfilled it. Now, the magnificent truth is that provision, the prefix for, the prefix pro means for, provision is for vision. So, the more in the vision of God you are for your life, the more you can expect your endeavors to be divinely financed. God, are you listening to me? God is not in the habit of giving people his resources to do their thing. But, but if you are doing what he has determined, then he is obligated to fund and finance it. Are you there? And so it is important, whether you're a church, a ministry, a business, for your household, for your it is important for you to grab God's, catch God's vision for your life, and then once you have it, to weigh your activity against what he said do. Are you there? And so once a year here at the Place of Grace, we look at the vision of the house, not only to make sure that we're in alignment with what God is saying, but also in attempt to articulate a couple of things that I believe the Spirit of Grace would have us to do and accomplish collectively as a people of God. Remember, the Bible says God takes the solitary and places them in families. When God connects you to a vision, a household of faith, it's not just because you need a church or like the pastor. It's because, again, in the Hebrew, that word, uh, God, the family there, God takes the solitary and puts them in families. The Hebrew word there is mishpaka. And again, that word means people of the same class. And it doesn't mean class like high class, low class, but class like university class. In other words, what God does when he connects you to a vision, when he connects you to a house, when he connects you to a purpose, he connects you to people who have similar destiny to you. Uh, I'll never forget when the Lord was, was ministering this to me, and he said, son, it's like going to the university. If you're a pre-law major, you have to take certain classes. If you're a pre-med student, you have to take certain classes. So you know certain pe that people in this class have similar destiny to you. You're in pursuit of the same thing. Well, God is at least as, as smart as university presidents. And he knows how to put people where they are to be in order to get what they need to fulfill purpose and vision. Now, it is to that, it is to that, that I need to speak a little. And again, I've said to you for weeks uh, now as we have dealt with this, uh, I've directed you to John chapter 5, reminding you that John chapter 5 is the foundational scripture from which this ministry catches its vision and from which the name Place of Grace is derived. The, the, the Bible says in John chapter 5 that there was a place in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, uh, uh, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Beth Ezda. And Beth Ezda in Hebrew means house of grace or house of mercy or house of the outpouring of grace and mercy. In other words, it was a place where the grace of God and the mercy of God was to be poured out. Now, I've talked about the various specifics of that, understanding the grace of God, a place of undeserved favor, a place of enabling power. And the Bible says here in verse number three, it says, in these, at this pool, lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. And I have articulated more than once that here we are looking at a picture of the church it is a foreshadowing of the church as God has originally intended it to be, and it also gives insight into why the church is oftentimes not what it has been purposed to be. The Bible says that uh, there was a pool by the sheep gate or the sheep pertaining to the, to, or the pool pertaining to sheep, 
which again we know we are the sheep of God's pasture, called in the Hebrew Bethesda, meaning place of grace, place of undeserved favor, having five porches, five avenues into it, which are a type of the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, which Ephesians 4 tells us are all grace gifts to bring people in to the fullness of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible says here in verse 3 that people had gotten stuck in the porches, never getting to the pool and were waiting. And, and the scripture literally says they were impotent, which means lacking power. Now here's what I want you to see uh, for today's purposes. For an angel went down at a certain time in the pool and stirred the water, and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Once again, the Bible says, whoever stepped in was made well of whatever disease he had. And that's where we get the slogan for this ministry, a place where whoever can be healed of whatever. Because if the grace of God is available there, there is power to transform anything. And the people said, it said, now, verse 5 says, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? See, every line here is something I can preach. i got to keep going. Verse 7, The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred, but while I'm coming down, another steps down before me. We've talked about the atmosphere of the place where people are not, understanding the grace of God, they all think they have to be best, brightest, or first. And so this man has been coming to this place and been being cut off by other people for 38 years. Jesus says to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming down, another steps in before me. Jesus didn't ask him about the pool or the people. He just asked him if he wanted to be made well. But he had been in this church religious system for so long that he was dependent on people rather than Jesus for his healing. And Jesus, one of the reasons he came there was to change that mentality. And one of the things that we said, one of the things the Spirit of God is doing now as he is coming to his church and reclaiming his places is to change that mindset and that mentality, which is why you are seeing an emphasis on the doctrine of the grace of God in the church. Notice, the Bible says, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk, and immediately. Everybody say, immediately. immediately. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. We talked about the fact that if you're going to walk in the grace of God, you are going to be confronted by legalism. You're going to be confronted by tradition and religion as you attempt to walk out the walk of grace. Are you still here? He, he, he said, uh, he said uh, it's not lawful uh, for you to carry your bed. Verse 11, he answered and said, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Verse number 12, then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk, but the one who was healed, did not know who it was. Everybody look right up here at me. This is, again, another picture of the grace of God. And I've been saying, get ready for this, because Jesus is getting ready to heal and set free and deliver and change people who don't even know who he is. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you ready for that? Pastor, are you ready for that in your church? Are you ready for people to come to your church who have met Jesus, have encountered Jesus, and don't know who he is? Are you still in the room? Are you still in the room? Now watch this. It says, but, 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 but the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Verse number 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Everybody say, Jesus, Jesus found, him found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now again, I've preached almost every line of every part of this, so I cannot get stuck. What I've got to focus here is where the scripture points out a few things to us 
And I've been talking to you about this season being the season of dedication, that God is reclaiming his places, that he is calling upon his people for a time of dedication to his plans, to his purposes. But also, you need to hear this now, he is also expecting his people to make a certain dedication now to his places. God has places. And I've said this before, there has been in the church now a season of time, and rightly so. Look at your neighbor and say, rightly so. And rightly so, where it has been emphasized that the church is not a building. The church is not a location. That the people, indeed, are the church. And yet, while that is true, the Bible says an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. So that truth has been emphasized, and it has been understood. And even the COVID pandemic, as it came, it asserted the reality that people don't have to be in a building to get the truth. They don't have to be in the corporate gathering of saints in order to be ministered to. And so that was important. But now the pendulum has to swing more back towards the center. And this is one of the things the Spirit of God has purposed to do. It, the Lord said to me oh, some time ago, he said, Son, it has almost been overemphasized that the church is not a building. I said, sir, what do you mean? He said, it is true and it is right, but I do have designated places. I do have places that are dedicated and consecrated for my purpose and my plans, and my people need to understand that. Grab your neighbor's hand and say, there are designated places. And there are dedicated places where God has purposed to do certain things. And if you are one of them, or if you are in one of them, in this season, you need to be aware of it. Now you say, Bishop McClendon, what are you talking about? Right here in John chapter 5, the Bible says, for some reason, not known to man, but known to God, this place, this pool, Bethesda, was a place where God determined that an angel would come down at a certain time in the year and do something. And when the, angel, when the angelic activity occurred, supernatural things would happen. Now, I've said it before. At that time, angels had to come and go. They could not remain because while Jesus was on earth ministering, the earth was not the Lord's. It was under the dominion of the God little g of this world who had stolen the authority from Adam to perpetrate his things upon the earth. But when Jesus came and when the first drop of his blood hit planet earth, not only were the souls of men redeemed, but the planet and the creation itself was placed back in the hands of the great God Jehovah. So the earth is the Lord's. Bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb. Grab your neighbor's hand. Say, my daddy owns the land. I can go where I want. Now watch this. Watch this. And so, and so now the angels, there are angels that are here on earth that have assignments. They rem you're not listening to me. They remain. There are locations where God has purpose for certain angelic activity to happen. And remember, Matthew 13 tells us the, the reapers are the angels. The reapers are the So if the harvest is going to be reaped, it's going to require angelic activity. And if it is going to require angelic activity, it is going to require some people who know how to release angelic activity in the earth. How, is, how does that happen? The Bible says the angels excel in strength, hearkening unto the voice of the word of the Lord. So wherever the word of God is being preached, whatever the word of God is being taught, whatever the word of God is being sung, angels are in attendance. Touch three people and say, angels are in attendance. 
Now, I showed you in, in, in the book of Exodus when God is speaking to Moses and he tells Moses that he's going to bring his people out of the land of Egypt and he said, I will bring my people and my armies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you still here? I said, are you still here? Uh, put that up. I gave you the verses. I'm, I don't want to have to call them out. It's in, uh, it's in Exodus, I think, 6, 7. The Pharaoh will not heed you that I may land, put my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel. So God separates his people from his armies. And his armies from his people. See, one of the names of the Lord is the Lord Saboah which is the Lord of the angel armies of heaven. Glory to God. Revelation 12 tells us that Michael and his angels fought against Lucifer and his angels. Amen. Amen. That's right. Yes, sir. Revelation 12. Jesus says in Luke 10, I witnessed that. I saw Satan, he said, fall like lightning from heaven. Are you still in the room? So there are designated places of angelic activity. And when, uh, and when God's people move, his angels move. Put it back up. Put it back up. Put it back up. Put it back up. He said, I, I will bring my... my I will bring my armies and my people. So my armies move with my people. Don't miss this. Where my people gather, my armies gather. Now that is why the corporate gathering of saints is something that Satan wanted to shut down. That's why presidents and prime ministers wanted to shut down the corporate gathering of saints. Because even though they don't know what's happening in the heavenlies, the spirits that are moving them do not want the people of God to gather. Because if the people of God gather, there is an army that gathers wherever those people gather. Are you there? And what the problem is, too many churches gather without that knowledge without that revelation, without that understanding. And too many preachers preach anything they want rather than preaching the Word. Come on. Because angels don't move on my thoughts. They don't move on my degrees. They don't move on my education. They don't move on my theology. They move at the Word of God. Yeah. Oh, 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 God, I feel you. They move at the word of God. Can you imagine thousands of people with God's word in their mouth? Can you imagine a choir of 100 or 200 people who aren't just singing anything they want, but they are making sure that the word of God is set to music? you to hear it because I've seen it and I, I said it to you again get this idea out of your mind that you got one little angel so if 2,000 people gather there are 2,000 angels ah uh -uh, baby no 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 the Bible says that you and I have come to an innumerable yes, sir. company of angels and to the city of the living God. The Bible says one can chase a thousand, but two can put ten. This is talking about the power of two people on earth and what happens in the heavens. We have erroneously misinterpreted Jesus' statement when he said, you know, about the little children. He said, their angel always behold my face, which means every child of God has at least one angel 
that is always in the face of God. Y'all don't hear me. You're not, you, you, how can you just sit there and look at me? Read your Bible and you'll know this stuff. The Bible says you have one angel that always attends his faith. That's That's why the Bible says that you are registered. You are registered in heaven. The moment you are born again, you are registered there. Why? Because the angels have to know who they must attend to. And devils know who they must bow to. Do you remember when Paul was casting out the devil and the seven sons of Stephen tried to do the same thing? And the Bible says the demon, which is a fallen angel, said, Paul, I know. Peter, I mean, Jesus, I know. But who? Meaning your name is not in the registration booklet. You are not born again. And the angels know we do not have to obey you. Give me this mic. That is why the children of God who know the name of Jesus must now become the policemen of the spiritual atmosphere. Because devils know they don't have to go when Governor Newsom says go. You don't have to like me, I don't care. They don't have to go when President Biden says go. They don't have to go when the mayor says go. But when the saints get together and they say murder, Now catch it, there, there are designated places, and if you are one of them, God is calling upon you and upon us collectively to become a place of dedication. That's one of the reasons why the Lord said to me, he said in the next 12 months, you've got to dedicate this building. We moved in here, we never dedicated it. Are you still there? But the dedication of a building is not a ceremony. It's not just some place where you get guys in collars and chains and robes and have a homily and a few songs. No, no. A dedication of a place is when you know what its purpose is. When you know what's supposed to happen there. And the people gather and they summon the angelic host to come and attend to the purpose of that location to get a work done. Are you listening to me? I wish I had time to preach this like I feel it. God decides on these places and when he decides on places where he has purposed for activity to go. I need you to understand this. Angels steward purposes from generation to generation. When God, you're not listening. When God decides I'm going to do this at this location, in this city, in this spot, I'm going to do a thing. The angels hold that purpose and they wait for somebody to catch hold of it and somebody to start declaring it. And if a generation goes by and nobody catches it, the angels will hold the purpose until somebody comes to seek the Lord and find out what he wants. And if nobody does, they'll die off and another generation until the Spirit of God leads somebody to stop just having church, stop just singing songs, stop just preaching messages, but to get on their faces and find out, God, what do you want for this season, for this area, for this region? What's on your mind? And once somebody sets themselves to seek the Lord, The angels will come and give them all the information they need. That's what happened to Daniel in chapter 10. The angel says, the moment you set yourself to seek the Lord, I was sent. Are you still here? Go 
Go, go to, uh, God help me. Go to 1 Chronicles 21. Go to 1 Chronicles 21. <sighs> go to 1 Chronicles 21. How long did I say I would take? Well, I got eight of those left. Watch this. First Chronicles 21. I want you to see something here. I'm going to move quickly. First Chronicles 21. Verse number 17. This is when David buys Ornan's threshing floor. In order to offer a sacrifice. You remember the story? David has numbered the children of Israel. He's taking a census God didn't tell him to take. When he does, God releases a plague. And the people in the army of Israel begin to die. David seeks the Lord. Says, God, I did this. They didn't. Please stop killing the people. And the Bible says God sent a prophet to David and said, this is what you do. Go offer a sacrifice. So David does. Watch this. First Chronicles 21, verse 17 and David said to God was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered I am the one who is sin and evil indeed but these sheep what have they done let your hand I pray O Lord my God be against me and my father's house but not against your people that they should be plagued therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad that is David's seer his prophet to go to David and say that David should go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite on the threshing floor I, I want this spot God was specific about the location. I want it right here. Meaning if you do it anywhere other than here, you won't get my response. Are you still here? So David went up at the word of Gad, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Oren turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were, uh, and his four sons hid themselves, but Ornan continued threshing wheat. Are you still with me? So David came to Ornan and Ornan looked at David and he went out to the threshing floor, verse 22. Then David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said, take it, don't, you don't have to pay for it. Look at verse 24. But King David said, no, but I will surely pay for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight of the place and David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the name of the Lord and he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offerings. So the Lord commanded the angel and the angel returned his sword to the sheep. At that time when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. Now why is that important? Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. 2 Chronicles chapter 3. You still with me? Yes. Second Chronicles chapter number three, verse number one. It says, now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. Now David is dead. Remember, David wanted to build God a house. God said, it's good that you had it in your heart to build me a house, but you're not going to build it. Your son Solomon's going to build it. So now David is dead and Solomon has begun to build the house. Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. On Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan. So God said, I want that place, David, because I have purpose to do something on that spot. Don't tell me God doesn't have designated places. I have purpose to do something on that spot. And that's where Solomon begins to build. What mountain was it? Huh. Go back to Genesis 22. You still here? Verse number one, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, 
Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, now take your son, your only son whom you love, go to the land of and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. You know this story. Abraham goes, builds an altar, offers, uh, is getting ready to offer Isaac, and God stops him. So the spot. Y'all aren't hearing me. The spot that Abraham was told to offer Isaac, which is a type of Christ. The son of favor. And the whole thing, he's supposed to sacrifice him. But just as he's getting ready to sacrifice him, God provides a ram. And the ram is sacrificed. It what? Can they not hear me? What, what, what is this? Fix it. No, 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 no. They can hear me, but, but give me on the mic. So, so what is this? This is the sacrifice of Jesus foreshadowed. He is the, the, the ram is the substitutionary sacrifice as Christ is the substitutionary sacrifice for us. That's why to this day, when the Jews are going to sound the sound of liberty, they get the shofar. The shofar is a ram's horn. It is a type of the sacrifice, the substitutionary sacrifice. They don't even see that because it's been hidden from their eyes. Are you still here? So that place that Abraham sacrifices is the same place that David sacrifices is the same place that Solomon builds a temple. Are you still here? In, in other words, it was a place that was dedicated for a move of God. I need you to pay attention. And there were certain things that could only happen in that place. Now, this is why in the coming move of the spirit of grace, the Lord said to me, he said, tell my people I am reclaiming my spaces. I'm reclaiming my spots. Are you still here? Go to Hebrews chapter 10. He said, tell them I'm reclaiming my places. I'm reclaiming my spots. In the close of the last era, just before COVID and the shift that happened during COVID, many churches shut down. Some of them never should have been opened in the first place. You don't have to like me. I'm not here to be liked. Some of them were not supposed to be open. In the, as a matter of fact, about 50% of the churches in America need to shut down and go join somebody else's church. Because so many just went, they weren't sent. They have no vision. They have no insight. They have no purpose. They just have a gift. I told you this. The call of God is not enough to do the work of ministry. I'm going to say it again. The call of God is not enough to do the work of ministry. The Bible says not how can they preach except they be called. It says how can they preach except they be sent. The Bible says many are called but few are chosen. I told you last week, I asked God, what is the difference between the chosen and the called? And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, when I was 23 years old, he said, the chosen are the called who waited long enough in my presence to be sent. They sat under somebody. They allowed somebody to teach them and lay hands on them. They allowed themselves to be circumcised that they would not be bastard sons in illegitimate pulpits. Yeah. 
And so in the move of just before the end of the era, a lot of them shut down because they weren't supposed to be open anyway. You don't have to like me, it's the truth. Why? Because there are too many doctrines, too many voices, too many Jesuses, too many ideologies. You don't have to like me, it is the truth. If you are preaching other than this scripture, you are out of order, sir. You are out of order, ma'am, and you never should have been open in the first place. And I know what I'm saying because God told me, he said, I'm shutting some of them down and they will not reopen. I'll never forget it when the Lord said to me, he, he said, when I call a man or a woman, I want you to do the very same thing your mother wanted you to do when she called you. Come see what I want. And once you come and find out what God wants, you cannot be tossed with every wind of doctrine. When you know what your assignment is, when you know what you are called to do, when you have a vision from God and you have been shut in with God long enough to know it's from Him. Nothing anybody says can pull you off your assignment. No other church's success can cause you to change what you do in order to fit the mold of success. That was one of the problems with the church in America. Our God was not Jesus. Our God was success. I was in Kenya praying, and the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, son, this was before COVID. He said, son, a good portion of the American church is not worshiping me. They are worshiping success. Are you in the room? It's time to us to understand you get nothing in this kingdom by pursuing it. You get everything in this kingdom by pursuing him. I'm going to say it again. You get nothing in this kingdom by pursuing it. So if you're trying to be an important preacher, you're already going to fail. If you're trying to have big numbers, you're already going to fail. If you want to be the it in the community, you are destined to fail because you do not succeed in this kingdom by pursuing things. You succeed in this kingdom by pursuing him. And he said, if you'll put me first, I'll add the stuff. I don't know why I'm preaching like this, but I can't stop because God has designated some men and some women and some places. And it's not going to rain everywhere. It's going to rain where God has designated it to rain. And if you want to get the water, you're going to have to be under the spout where the glory is coming out. And if it's not coming out of your place, you better get out. You still here? Yeah. Let me give you two more scriptures and I'll be done. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching now let me let, let, let me let me say this because the spirit of god gives an instruction here and the instruction is very specific you see one of the reasons that a lot of churches had to shut down and there's a shift in the mentality is because the reason we were doing church was erroneous. Amen. 
the reason people were gathering was erroneous. He said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love. Y'all here? And good works. So the assembly and the assembling of ourselves together is not for you. It's not for you to get a word. It's not for you to be encouraged. Say, so you, you look at me, you don't like me. You don't, you don't like me. But, but you should have a word when you get here. You got a Bible, you got the Holy Spirit. This is the place you come to get the word confirmed, not where you come to get a word. This is where you come to get the word you have confirmed. And one of the ways you know you're in the right place is if when you keep coming, the preacher keeps confirming what God is saying to you and keeps bearing witness to what you're being told. That's evidence that you're in the right place. But the purpose of the gathering of saints it's not to get a word. According to the scripture, it is to stir up love and good works in your brother. So the context of the scripture is that those who are considering more than themselves and their personal benefit from the assembly will be moved by the Holy Spirit not to miss it. You, you didn't get what I just said. So there's a whole lot of people who haven't donned the doors of a church since COVID hit because they found out they could get the word at home. But you missed the point, baby. The objective of this is not for you to get a word. The objective of this is for you to stir up somebody else. To love. And good works. Now stay with me because I'm about to hit a place you're not going to like. Somebody said, Bishop, you've been there for about 20 minutes in my world. Watch, 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 watch. And, and I, I got to get this because it's my last opportunity in vision month. I got to get you to understand why God is going to start calling people to gather in this spot. It's not because of my preaching. It's because of his purpose. And it's because of apprehending something that is on his mind. Are you there? See, remember what it said. He said, don't forsake, especially as you see the day approaching. Especially as you, what day is he talking about? Day there is catalyst. So he's talking about the coming of the Lord. So if the Bible says, especially as you see the day approaching, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves. Don't you think the devil will do everything he can as the day is approaching to keep the saints from assembling together. He'll give reasons, excuses, government, diseases. Well, I ain't got to go. I can get the word here in my flippy flops. And you can. And that's okay. And sometimes that's fine. But you shouldn't always get the word in your flippy flops. And it's a fact that most people who are going to church every week before COVID are going about two times a month now. That's fine. Because the fact is actually we were doing church too much. We were having church so often that people couldn't do anything else but go to church. I'm not here. I'm talking about the church in general. No time to witness. No time to win souls. I'm in church. Can't... Can't go on the street doing evangelism. I got to go to church. I remember, I remember when I went before the Lord and when the, when the midweek service wasn't working out here because of all the stuff we were doing. And I, and I went to the Lord and I said, God, I said, this isn't working. We got to, it isn't working. I'm traveling. I'm doing all the stuff you tell me to do. I'm preaching here, there. And every time I come back on Wednesday, then I'm somewhere else. And, and so, God, this isn't working. I'm wearing myself out. And I'll never forget it. The Lord said, I never told you to do it anyway. I said, what? He said, no, I, I never told you to do that here. He said, you're just doing it because that's what church people do. Boy, it's quiet. 
And then he gave me the plan of the poetic encounters, and that has worked magnificently. Why? Because it's God's idea for the place, for the season, for the purpose. I'm almost done. He said, let us stir one another to love and good works. Good works has to do not with just doing good stuff. It has to do with doing something in the assembly. Ah, I can't do that from the bed. But then he says also, let us stir one another up to love. Do you remember what Jesus said concerning the last days? He said, and because iniquity will abound. The love of many will wax cold. So the assembly is one of the places in the last days that God says you got to come to keep your love hot. The, 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 the assembling of yourself together is one of my remedies for keeping your love hot hot because iniquity will abound the love of many will wax cold but those who do not forsake the assembly will keep their love hot now let me tell you one of the ways that you're going to keep your love hot being offended offended so you can't get offended from the bedroom <laughs> well I don't go down there though, that church because you know I get offended when I go down there they won't let me sit where I want to sit I can't do what I want to do they got places and even the parking lot attendants they ain't nice and the security guards ain't nice and I can't even get to bishop I want to get to bishop I need bishop I need bishop I need bishop I can't get to bishop and every time I go to the bishop they cut me off and I'm offended well let me say it out loud I love you and I'd lay hands on every one of you but I'm not your answer Jesus is the answer but not only that see you get offended and then you stay away offended. And what you don't understand is your offense is keeping your faith from working. And God wants you to get in here and get offended and learn how to love people even when you're offended. You don't like me right now. It's a part of the reason for gathering. Luke 17, put it up. Somebody's got to preach this to you. So we got thousands of people who don't know how to walk in love because they got offended in church and stayed offended when this is the place you're supposed to learn how to overcome your offense by walking in love to people who don't like you. This is where you learn to deal with people you don't like. This is the place. Let me just read to you the red part of your Bible, which means Jesus said this. Luke 17. Now watch this, children. Remember, let me give you one other little nugget here. I'm almost done. How does faith work? Uh-huh. No, it goes by speaking. How does it work? Faith worketh by. Faith worketh by love so if your love gets cold your faith won't work your faith won't work if you learn how to stay mad at everybody oh so 
but your faith won't work if you learn how to get offended and stay home and be offended. See, God wants you to come face to face next week with the person you don't like so you can learn how to walk in love. He wants you to have to sit next to him. He wants you to have to deal with him. You don't like me because this is gospel preaching. Luke 17, let me show it to you. Then he said to his disciplined followers. That's what disciple means because there are followers and then there are disciplined followers. And the pr problem with the American church is we are filled with followers, not disciplined followers. Because discipline requires adherence to principles. Then he said to his disciplined followers. Watch this. Watch how beautiful this is. It is impossible. Time out. This is Jesus who just said all things are possible. And he's just telling you this is impossible. And let me qualify it. He said with God all things are possible. But here you ain't dealing with God. You're dealing with folks. So that's why he said, now this here is impossible. And if you're a follower of mine, I want you to know this here is impossible. It is impossible that you will not be offended while following me. Where is my, where am I, where are my Christians? Where are you? It is impossible. Where are my Bible reading? It is impossible. That while you're following me, you won't get offended. Translation. You will be offended. Even in the right church. Even in the right corporate gathering of saints. You will be offended. Let me tell you why. Because your being offended is my part of perfecting your love walk, saith the Lord. Can I say it that way? Saith the Lord. Can I promise that? Saith the Lord. It is impossible that no offenses should come. Now, in case you think well, Jesus is just all right with it, he said, ah, now woe to him who through they come, who, who they come through. So if somebody is just set on offending you, God says, I'll deal with them. But now watch this, watch, watch. It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now what happens if a millstone is thrown around your neck and you're thrown into the sea? You sink. And this is what Jesus is saying. Anybody who offends you is going down. You didn't hear what he said. If they are offending you on purpose and you're mine, they will sink. It would be better. It would be, it'd be better if a millstone was thrown around their neck and thrown in the sea because at least then they would know why they're not rising. No, you're missing. You know, at least then they would know why they're not rising. But if they keep offending you and thinking they're okay, what's gonna happen is they are not gonna rise and they'll wonder why. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown in the sea, then you should offend one of these, my little ones. That's what Jesus says. When you get offended, take heed to yourself. Look at how powerful this is. Jesus says, now here is the first principle of offense. When you get offended, don't go after the person who offends you. When you get offended, pay attention to you. 
pay attention to you. Why? 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 Because remember the word offense, the Greek word is scandalon, from which we get our English word scandal. The word actually means the trigger on a trap. So what offense means is when you get offended, it means you step on something that is ordained to stop your progress. That's the purpose of offense. That's why David learned the key. David learned the key to breakthrough. He learned that he gets his greatest anointings in the presence of his enemies. You anoint my head with oil in the presence of my enemies. Every offense is a door to a greater anointing. If you pay attention to yourself and not to the person who offended you. Take heed to yourself. Back to Luke 17, I'm done, I'm done, come on. If your brother sins, take heed to yourself. Why, why? Because see what offense does, that's why the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence because out of your heart, the issues, the forces of life are flowing. What is that? Righteousness, peace, victory, healing, joy, leadership, righteousness, sanctification, protection. These are the forces that are flowing out of your heart. And what happens is when you get offended, those forces get jammed. you said I'm not doing it I'm not going there I'm not dealing with them I'm not and then you start getting aches and pains and cancers and tumors and cysts and diseases and you're wondering why while you're tithing and praying you're sick because you have jammed up your forces by trying to pay somebody back or trying to avoid them instead of taking heed to yourself and deciding no 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 this is a trap i know what this is and i am not going to let the enemy trap me so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to go to sister doohickey i'm going to smile in her face i'm going to say i've been thinking of you don't have to say what i've been thinking i'm just going to say i've been thinking of you I'm going to smile, I'm going to be nice, and I'm going to do that until my forces kick in to the point. See, because you're going to have what you say. I love you, Sister Doohickey. You're going to have what you say. I'm going to do that till my forces kick in. And when my, when my forces kick in, I'll be able to see Sister Doohickey, and it won't bother me at all. And what just happened? See, love is one of those forces. Watch it. What, what, what? 17, put it up, put it up, put it up, put it up. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. God, I, I don't have time to teach all this. See, let, let me tell you why, you're, why, why God says to forgive him. Because if you forgive, you release the forces. A lot of cancers, tumors, and infirmities are a product of unforgiveness and bitterness. The Bible says bitterness will cause rotten, rot in the bones. I got to finish this. Now watch this. And if you repent, forgive. Now, let, me say, let me say something like this. One of the things about putting the word of God to work, and this is something that people don't understand. Now I'm way over time. But see, I cannot let offense run you out of a place you're supposed to be in. It is too critical now.
One of the reasons that God says to put the word to work. See, here's the thing, children. Whenever you put God's word to work, the, you release the spirit of God to get involved in a situation. So when, when God says, if your brother sins against you, forgive it, it, it rebuke him. The word rebuke means to say, stop it, that's enough. It doesn't mean to th throw a stick at their car. It, 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 it means to say, stop it, that's enough. In other words, if your brother, you know what, that's enough. You've done that enough. Now, what is God saying? Do it. He's not saying do it to confront them. He's saying do it because it's my word. And if you do my word, my spirit will get involved. I'm not telling you to forgive them so they like you immediately. I'm not telling you to forgive them so you can like them immediately. I'm telling you to forgive them because when you forgive them, you release my spirit to get into this situation and to begin to deal with you and them. And if both of you are mine, one of you is going to be changed. And hopefully both. Watch this. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Watch this. I'm reading on. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our Now watch this. Watch this. Isn't it interesting? The apostles said, increase our faith. Not to get more money. Not to get more cars. Not to get a house. When they asked for an increase of faith, it was to forgive brothers. Is it possible that God has been teaching us faith not just to get stuff? Is it possible that God has taught us the principles of faith not just to get bills paid, but to get love flowing amongst brothers and sisters? It is in response to this that Jesus teaches the seed faith principle. So I'm supposed to keep releasing the seed of forgiveness and love toward my brother. That's where he says, if you have faith. Isn't that interesting? You're right, play so they know I'm leaving. Are you in the room with me? Every major promotion in your life will be preceded by a significant offense. I'm going to say it again. Every major promotion in your life will be preceded by a significant offense because the adversary knows he can do nothing to stop you if you are working with the forces of the kingdom of God. The violent take everything by force. He knows, he knows nothing can stop you as long as you are working with the forces of the kingdom. So his only chance is to get you to stop you by shutting down your forces. 
Lay your hand on your brother. Lay your hand on your sister. And I am telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, one of the reasons that the corporate gathering of saints is going to be so significant in these last days is so believers can learn to love one another. He's going to have you come. He's going to set you in a house. I need you to hear me. You may not come every week, but don't let a month go by and you don't go to the place God has set you. Don't let it happen. Don't forsake. Don't forsake it. Are you there? There's so much to this. I just hit one aspect because the Lord told me to hit that one. Are you still in the room? How many of you still love me? How many of you know I don't care? I'm going to preach to you anyway. You know that. I mean, I love you and I appreciate it, but I, it ain't going to change what I say. You know? I love you. <laughs> I said, Bishop, don't say that. No, I love you, but, but it's not going to change what I say. I am, I, I am, I am commanded to say what I'm saying to you. Are you there? And so I tell you, by the Spirit of God, if you're a part of this end time move of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to start dealing with you about making sure you don't forsake assembly. That you stir and keep the love hot. Look at your neighbor say, even if you get on my nerves from time to time. I'm, I'm going to keep my love hot. I'm going to keep my love hot. I'm going to keep it hot. Keep it hot. Are you with me? Put your hand on your brother. Put your hand on your sister. And say this in the name of Jesus. I make a determination. I will walk in love. I will not allow any offense to enter my heart. I will reverse every curse and I will speak and release the blessing of the Lord upon you even when you get on my nerves. Keep your hand on them. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, <laughs> now's the time. <laughs> if you pray in the Spirit, now's the time. You don't know what you're praying for as you ought, now's the time. If you pray in the understanding, then go ahead and pray in the understanding. Just pray, God bless my brother, bless my sister, and help me to walk in love with them and them to walk in love with me. We will not have a backbiting, backstabbing environment here. This is a place of grace. A place where whoever can be healed of whatever. And no matter what offense, no what hurt, what harm. This is a place where if you keep coming, the love will wax hot. You'll learn how to love your brothers and sisters and see this is what must happen see we got this wrong we thought Jesus said that the world will know that we're his disciples when we love them that's not what he said he said they will know that we are his disciples when we have love one for another he was talking about his followers not the world you're not listening to me he was talking. That's when they'll know there's something different about us. When we disagree and we don't fight. When we are injured and we don't strike back. You don't like me now. Keep praying. He said, this is how they'll know that you're mine. When no matter what happens to you, 
You refuse to leave your brother or your sister wounded and broken. You refuse to leave them damaged. You refuse to let your love grow cold. You refuse. My God, lay your hands on yourself, lay your hands on yourself, lay your hands on yourself, lay your hands on yourself. Listen, 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 lay your hands on yourself. Listen to me now. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. Thank you, Lord. If you, I'm telling you, there is a healing grace flowing in this room. And there are things that are being released. Yes, Lord, yes. Go lay your hands on her. Lay your hands upon yourself. If you know that you have somebody you need to release. See, here's part of the problem. Dead people can still be affecting your future. Never said that before in my life, but I see it right now. There are some of you, you got family members and friends who offended you. They are gone and you are still trapped. Because you have never released that and given it to the Lord. (laughs) 
Some of you need to learn just to say this. Remember, your faith is released by your words. Some of you need to learn just when somebody brings that person up, when they talk about them, you just say, I bless the memory. I bless the memory. Release your faith. I just saw, I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, I just saw people in graves underground. And I saw strings coming from them to the souls of people sitting in this room. You say that's a rather morbid vision. It's a very clear thing. If whether the person is alive or gone, if you need to release them. Say this out loud after me. Just you can call the name quietly and say, Lord, this is for this one, this is for that one. If somebody in the house of faith has done it, get it done now. Say, Lord, I refuse to be full of care or anxiety about this thing anymore. I refuse to carry offense, to let offense enter my heart. I refuse it. In the name of Jesus, I give this person, not, not just, just between you and God, you don't have to say it, out loud I give these people whoever they are call their names out for I give them to you even if they're gone say Lord I'm releasing this to you in the name of Jesus if they're gone just say I bless the memory whenever they come up whenever the hurt comes up just respond to it I bless the memory Jesus spoke to trees you need to speak to images, thoughts. Are you there? The Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. And I declare in the name of Jesus, spirits of oppression, vengeance, I command you to loose God's sons and let his daughters go free today, now. And I release the peace of God to rule and abide in that heart like an umpire. upon yourself say this out loud say Lord I receive your word I accept that there is something about the corporate assembly the corporate gathering of saints that you have ordained you have programmed it to keep my love hot my works going forth my heart free of offense I receive it as a part of my end time assignment in the name of Jesus now if you receive the word of the Lord clap your hands and thank God for his word if you were blessed by the word thank God for it if the Spirit of God spoke to you, if He put His finger on something, thank God for His Word. Do it now. Look at your neighbor and tell them something supernatural just happened for you 
and something greater is on its way to you. Find somebody else and tell them you just qualified for the anointing for your next promotion, for your next elevation. Come on, prophets out there, tell them it is surely on the way. person under the sound of my voice whether you're watching me live streaming or whether you are in this tabernacle I want you to get ready with me to sow into the word of God now hear me real clearly if you're visiting with me today you're under no obligation to participate in this one of the things that we have learned here at the place of grace from the teachings of Paul the Apostle. He said in the book of Galatians, let him who is taught in the word communicate in all good things with him that teaches. The word actually means to respond. He was talking about giving. And then in that same chapter, just a verse or two down, he says that he that sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption but he that sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap life everlasting I am now Zoe unstoppable life there he is not talking about being born again he is talking about the life that is in the word of God once the word is taught to you there's life that flows to you from that word Paul says when that happens, when you're taught in the Word, you're to communicate, you're to respond back. And he says, you're to sow to the Spirit, not to the ministry, not to the preacher, to sow to the Spirit. Why? Because it is the Spirit of God that taught you. It is the Spirit of God that instructed you. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 4, and these things go together, line up online, precept upon precept, upon precept. Jesus said, that whenever the word of God is sown in your heart, he said, Satan comes immediately to steal the word that was sown. But Paul says, when you sow to the spirit after you have heard the word, you will from the spirit reap Aeneos Zoe. The unstoppable life of that word will continue to thrive and you'll be taken into it. I have learned, and this is one of the things we hear in this house, we teach and believe. That when you sow into the word of God, when the word is taught, the enemy can no longer steal that word. The life of that word will continue to produce. This is one of the reasons why people can sit under the same word, hear the same thing. One person's life is transformed. The other goes away and is unchanged. It's not because they didn't hear the word. It's because they didn't sow to the spirit. They didn't appreciate the word. Now there's more ways to sow to the spirit than giving but this is a fundamental and foundational act and Paul teaches us this is not Clarence McClendon this is not contrived this is the word of God but see my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge sometimes it's what we don't know to do that causes us to be in certain places this is a secret of the kingdom of God I want every person under the sound of my voice, who has heard this word and received it, especially if the Holy Spirit put his finger on something in your life, gave an answer, solution, clarity. I want you to sow in to the word. No compulsion, no manipulation. If you don't feel impressed to do anything, please do nothing. But if the Spirit of God is leading you, then I want you to cooperate and participate with me because I'm going to do it and I encourage you to do the same right there on your computer screen right there on your smartphone there's a donate button there's a way for you to do it if God is leading you do it 
You can also text give. You can text C E M M to 41444. Follow the prompts. Once again, as I said before, if you're watching me live streaming and the word of God found you, I want you to call my prayer ministers. They're ready to pray for you. Some of you need the prayer of agreement right now. Maybe you need to forgive someone. Maybe something in the spirit of God ministered to you was so impactful that you were sitting there and saying, oh, I need to do something. Call my prayer minister, 310-323-2600. Let us agree with you in prayer. And I encourage you, when you call, so something into the kingdom of God. 310-323-2600. I'm talking to you. There's some of you watching me. And the Spirit of God just literally brought liberty to your life by His Word. You need to respond to it. Let us pray for you. If you've got the Bishop McLennan app, you can do it that way. If you're in the tabernacle and you're giving, if you're making out a check, C-E-M-M. If you're giving cash, use the envelope. If you desire to do it on a bank or credit card, get up right now. Get up right now. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't look to see who else is doing it. Get up and do it right now. And so as the Spirit of God directs you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over every sower, over every man, woman, boy, or girl that you are moving on right now. I pray, number one, in favor. Number two, in finance. Number three, in things being added to them. And number four, in things that money cannot buy. I pray that you increase them on every side. In the name of Jesus, if you receive that, say, it's mine. I agree. In Jesus' name, let's worship the Lord. We're on our way home. Thank God for you and your patience. Sing, children. And prosperity. It's a new season. Sing it one more time. It's a new season. It's a new season. It's a new day. It's a new day. Fresh anointing. It's going Season of power and prosperity. It's a new season. Say it one more time. It's a new season. It's a new season. It's a new day. It's a new day. Minister communion real quickly. The elements get them if you're watching me at home. If you don't have crackers and juice, get bread and water. The Bible says the bread which we bless, the cup which we bless is how we partake of the finished work of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord directed me just a Sunday or so, I believe it was now, before the COVID pandemic hit. He said, I want you to begin to minister communion in every service to this people. And he said, don't stop until I tell you. And he hasn't told me to stop yet. So in every Sunday worship, we minister communion elements and God has protected us supernaturally. He has preserved us. Come on, thank him for telling you it's just extraordinary and one of the things we teach here is that communion the Lord's table is not just an ordinance it's not just a sacrifice according to the Word of God it is the way of escape not a way the way that's what Paul says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit 
And he also tells us that this is the wisdom of God. What communion actually is, is one of the ways that the new creation continues to operate at optimum level. It's something the Spirit of God gave to the new creation. If you've never heard my teaching on communion, you should get it and listen to it. The Lord impressed me that I'm to teach it again here soon because it is such a powerful revelation. And when you understand it, supernatural things occur. It was born out of a visitation I had with the Lord Jesus. And he taught me in that visitation. He said that when we take the Lord's table, we're dealing with two different bodies one Jesus but two different bodies you say Bishop that sounds strange it sounds strange if you don't read your Bible in 1 Corinthians 15 beginning at verse 35 the Bible talks about the body that was sown and the one that was raised and it was not the same body it said one was sown but another body was raised same Jesus but two different bodies they differed in glory he said it was sown in weakness it was raised in power it was sown in corruption it was raised in incorruption it was sown a natural body it was raised a spiritual body it's a powerful thing and when Jesus took the bread he said this is my body given for you as often as you do it and that when we receive the bread we are to be receiving that body before the resurrection that took our sin, our sickness, and our disease. The Bible declares that Jesus took what you and I should have. And not only sin, the Bible says he took the curse. See, he not only paid for your sins, he took the curse. Which means the consequence you and I should have received for sin. He took that too. Y'all aren't hearing me. God help me. And it is illegal for Satan to charge you twice for what Jesus has already paid for once. I want you to lift that bread and say, Lord, I receive your body given for me. I receive that body that took my sin, my sickness, my lack and poverty, paid for it in full and the consequences paid in full I receive it in the name of Jesus charged to the cross and it is illegal for Satan to charge me twice for that which Jesus you have already paid for once I am free indeed let's all eat together Then the scripture says Jesus took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant. It is the new agreement in my blood. Two things I always point out here. Number one, Jesus didn't say it was his blood. He said it is the new covenant, the new agreement in my blood. That when we take this, we are taking in the new covenant. Every benefit, every blessing, every benefaction that should flow to us is ours, not of our works, but because of Jesus' finished work. Secondly, when the Lord visited me, he said, son, notice only with the cup do I speak of the new. I said, this cup is the new. And every time you take the bread and the cup, you are acknowledging the finished work of the old covenant and the unending possibilities of the new. The Bible declares, as he is, so are we in this world. Lift the cup and say, Lord, I receive the new, the resurrected, glorified body. As you are, so am I. And I boldly confess, I am bearing more and more the image of the heavenly man. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all drink together. And the people said, were you blessed today? Thank God for it. Thank God for it. 
I want every person here to lift your hands before the Lord. If you're watching me live streaming, I want you to do it as well. I want you to say these words out loud after me and mean them. Say, Lord Jesus, you are the reconciler. You are the one that has made us one again with God the Father. I thank you that you took my sin, my sickness, my disease, my lack, paid for it in full. And your resurrection is my receipt. It is my evidence that your sacrifice on my behalf was accepted by the Father. And I am accepted by the Father as I trust not in my works but in Jesus' finished work on my behalf. I am saved in the name of Jesus. If you believe it, shout about it. It's the truth. The work has already been done. Jesus did the heavy lifting. And if you just prayed with me, whether you're here or there, I want you before you go to bed tonight to write me. Just go to bishopmcclennan.com. Say, I prayed the prayer that reconciles the soul to God. And let us help continue helping you live this new creation life. You new creation, you. Clap your hands and thank God. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray now a hedge of protection in the north, the south, the east, and west around this people, their families, their households, and all they have on every side. We declare everything their hands touch prospers. We decree they continue to increase in the land which you give them. And we boldly confess the angels of the Lord encamp round about us, and they deliver us. For we are those that fear the Lord. And the people said, God bless you. We'll see you by his grace at the place of grace. Have a great week.